let me introduce myself just uh, quickly. My name is Eric Harless. I am the, the head backup nerd here. Uh, that is my official title. Um, I've been with the organization uh, specifically working on Enable Backup now for eight years. I hit my eight-year anniversary earlier this month. Um, but I've done 25 years plus in the data protection space, focusing on business continuity, uh, backup, disaster recovery, replication, high availability. Multiple roles at multiple different vendors uh, in the space, probably ones that you love and ones that you hate. Uh, but those have been sales, support, system engineering, and product management roles, predominantly product management, focusing on what do we build next, uh, what's the usability and the user experience, uh, you know, what are the missteps and successes that we've seen in our competition, um, learning from that industry as a whole. So. Um, I still do work with product management very closely. Uh, we conduct uh, regular, uh, either quarterly or biannual uh, partner advisory groups where product management will come in and actually present the roadmaps to you and ask for your feedback. We'll give you an opportunity to sign up for those future partner advisory groups at the end of the session today. Um, if you wanna reach out to me directly, you can do that via email uh, or on social media. Uh, my Twitter handle is at backup underscore nerd. Uh, if you want to reach me via email, it's eric.harless at n-able.com. Um, our agenda, uh, we'll go through some tools and resources. Uh, we'll look at the base authentication for the uh, JSON API for the backup.management uh, console. Uh, we'll then uh, transition into adding customers or customer management. And when I say customers, I mean customers or partners. Uh, customers typically implies end customers or end users underneath uh, your uh, MSP or reseller level accounts. Uh, but when I think about this, I, I look at it as managing partners because that could be working with end customers, with reseller MSPs, distributors, sub-distributors, uh, root containers, things of that nature. So. Uh, customers and partners will be used interchangeably uh, in documentation and uh, throughout the scripts. Uh, we'll then transition over into client deployment where we're going to use more of the command line uh, installer um, and then we'll look at some configuring devices as part of that client deployment um, and monitoring backup health. So this will transition over into uh, the client tool command line as opposed to the installer command line. Um, but there are uh, some uh, cloud service-based APIs that we can utilize also to push out settings and commands. Um, depending on where the audience goes with this, on the type of questions we have, we may um, stay here a little bit longer uh, or, or not. Um, and then um, uh, under monitoring backup health, like I said, that's going to be focusing on the command line, uh, what we call our client tool uh, components. So I'll take you through that. Um, give you some resources on how you can expand or utilize that one. Some things that I'm working on are building out uh, those uh, building blocks, if you will, to you know inject into your own monitoring policies or into your own configurations. Uh, then we'll wrap it up with um, uh, using the APIs to generate or export out reports. Uh, maybe it's for end of month billing, or maybe it's for daily notifications or email alerts, uh, things that you want to uh, get proactive on. So we'll go through that uh, concept. So starting out with the tools and the resources side, um, uh, I want to uh, definitely remind you guys that these are sample scripts. And while they are sample scripts, uh, they're not officially supported under any of the enable support programs or services. So if you take one of my scripts and you tweak it, adjust it, play with it, or even use it as is, um, and then you, you bring up support, hey, how do we do this? How do we do that? Um, can we do this? Can we do that? You know, short of something being broken inside of the API, them opening a ticket, escalating it through support or dev, um, they're not going to be able to help you a lot from a scripting and an automation perspective. Um, all of the sample scripts in my repository are uh, provided as is about warranty. Um, uh, Enable as a whole expressly disclaims, my legal department expressly disclaims uh, all applied warranties, including warranties of mercantility and or uh, of fitness for a particular purpose. Like I said, I try to write them toward a purpose, uh, but my goal is about broad adoption in the community and yours may be a very specific use case or task. Um, in no event uh, does uh, the legal side um, uh, 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 want or expect to be liable uh, for any third-party damages uh, arising out of the use or inability of use of those sample scripts. Um, and then as with any script you download from any source or any repository that you didn't build yourself, uh, make sure that you review, test, and understand what that script is doing before you download it, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, that you've downloaded before you uh, inject it or implement it into a production environment. 
uh, pull it apart, play with it in a lab environment, ask questions, reach out. Um, any of the scripts that I've worked or worked on or written um, have my contact information in the uh, body of the script uh, with uh, ways to reach out to me to ask those questions if you um, don't understand what a particular function or, or command does. Okay. So the second legal disclaimer. Sorry about that, guys. Um, the structure that um, we're going to go through on the tool side, uh, I'm going to give you a bit of what I utilize for my script development, um, how I go through uh, testing, monitoring, uh, configuring uh, uh, those, the various tools that you're going to come up against or, or run across. Uh, just because I use a particular tool doesn't mean you have to use that tool, uh, but I'll let you know why I utilize it or what why it made sense to me. Um, uh, and as I said, you know, I am probably in that that regular guy, a regular configuration. Um, not a wizard yet, not even a, not a, definitely not a, a nerd on the scripting and the API side just yet. Maybe on the backup API itself, but like I said, not on the full wrapper aspect of it. Um, I'm going to take you through um, uh, uh, at a high level some of the schema and structure around the API documentation, what's there as far as resources that are available to you. Uh, samples that are inside of there. I'm not going to read the docs to you, however, um, I'm going to give you the resources so you can use that as additional learning. Um, I'll point out my GitHub page, talk through some of the scripts that are on that environment. Uh, we'll look at the enabled cookbook here in just a few minutes. Um, I utilize PowerShell as the wrapper for the majority of my scripts, unless I'm working with a Mac or um, a Linux system. Um, although I know uh, there are users out there that like uh, uh, Python better or, or other platforms, um, and, and by all means, those are perfectly fine, especially if you're doing this in your environment, self-contained, and you can control where the scripts are running. I do most of my stuff for transportability, uh, the ability to inject it into our automation manager or for a third-party RMM and PSA user uh, to be able to inject it into their uh, platforms, and normally, um, or sorry, um, so far, PowerShell seems to be the most uh, transportable from that perspective. Uh, so PowerShell um, is what I went with there. Uh, Postman um, is a API uh, triggering um, management and testing tool. I'll talk a little bit more about that one, um, and I'll take you through some examples of using Postman to test the APIs without a wrapper. That way you can ensure that the API calls are working as expected before you introduce them into the PowerShell wrapper or a, a Python wrapper or any other type of, of uh, method or call, like a curl or, or what have you. Um, I utilize uh, Visual Studio Code with various plugins to uh, do my script development. Um, obviously, you could work with uh, PowerShell ICE or uh, you know any other uh, 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 code development tool, uh, but I found Visual Studio Code to be pretty reliable, um, especially in the uh, wake of uh, Microsoft dropping official support for the uh, PowerShell uh, ISE. Um, Things we're going to see from a, uh, a utility perspective, a lot of the uh, results that are going to come back out of the API calls are going to be in uh, Unix time. Uh, Unix time is the number of seconds since January the 1st, 1970, um, and it's a pretty big number. Um, so uh, that's referred to as uh, uh, epoch time. Um, uh, or epoch time, depending on how you pronounce that, I guess. Um, this quick converter here, there's several others on the web as well. Um, I also have uh, PowerShell functions embedded in, in several of my scripts that you can pull out and reuse yourself uh, that will convert those number of seconds since 1970 uh, to you know the current UTC or current local region time. Um, uh, so you'll see those results, and I'll talk about that one, but know that we can convert those really easily. You won't have to do a lot of work there. Um, we do utilize a JSON uh, API uh, for access to the, the backup.management console. Um, and sometimes when you're pulling data out, you get raw JSON structures, raw uh, uh, lists of data that may or may not be formatted in the most user-friendly way. Um, they're nice and compact and compressed for space, but they're not pretty and easy to read. Um, the JSON formatter, uh, and we'll pull that up and just touch on it a little bit, is really, really nice for fixing uh, formatting um, and even troubleshooting or testing uh, a piece of JSON code to see if it meets with a certain um, uh, standardization spec or to add the appropriate spacing and line breaks and so on uh, into the UI or into the uh, um, into the strings. Uh, the client tool command, this is our command line for backup, uh, the backup manager, the local client. Um, there's documentation links here for that. 
um, that will give you some of the, the more detailed commands. We'll go through a, a good portion of those uh, today uh, to kind of get you uh, structured around pulling data out by a client tool. Not so much management and monitoring, I'm sorry, management and configuration, but more about uh, just uh, uh, pulling the configuration, being able to monitor changes, things of that nature. And then, of course, uh, Firefox and Chrome. Um, I use the browsers uh, uh, with all of this, obviously. Um, sometimes I do utilize them in developer uh, mode or developer view. Uh, that way I can actually see the API calls that are being sent to the cloud uh, in context with uh, the right variables and the right syntax uh, versus just reading them out of the schema, which is you know not always going to be in full context. Uh, of what I'm trying to change. So it's a nice uh, level set, uh, what you think it should be versus what's actually being set. Uh, and then finally, um, you guys are probably familiar with Notepad++, great tool here to be able to see all those extra characters and lines and structures, uh, whether you're working with a CSV or a JSON format or an XML document. Um, you know, nice tool to have, uh, beats just a, you know, your good old regular Notepad. So uh, that was the high level. I've got a little bit more on each of these, and I'm going to open up some of the tools and take you through them. Uh, but I, I want you to see this uh, so that we know we stay on track and, and so on. Um, so the documentation aspect here, um, uh, and I know I said I don't want to read the documentation to you, but I want to touch on a couple of notes inside of here. Uh, there's multiple management services. I'm sorry, multiple API services, both on the management service and the reporting level. I'm going to take you through a little bit of the schema and give you some notes around the syntax and some of the examples that we're going to see here. Um, and then we'll drill into um, where my sample scripts are and some of the other tool locations before we start actually um, uh, running and, and uh, talking through that first script inside of uh, Postman. Okay. So if I bring this guy up, aha, there's my page. So um, if you come through the documentation uh, pages on uh, success.enable.com and go into backup and go into documentation, uh, eventually you'll get into the user guides. Uh, inside of user guides, there is service management, and right here is the JSON RPC API guide. Um, I just have the hot link directly to uh, the structure. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there are two services uh, that we're going to talk to. One is a management service. Uh, which is designed to uh, add new partners, new customers, um, uh, uh, grab st uh, st statistics for a, a device or a certain customer, uh, those kind of things. Um, and then there is a reporting service, which is designed uh, to pull historical information based on backup sessions, number of files protected, transfer times, things of that nature. Um, uh, you're going to utilize the same API location, uh, but you do understand sometimes you're going to be talking to a management service, sometimes you're going to be talking to distributed storage nodes uh, spread through all throughout the world, once again, depending on where you're backing up your data to and what the home node or the storage location uh, is. Um, the uh, environment um, when we start to query data is going to uh, present itself to you a couple different ways. Um, there's a whole set of columns in backup.management of statistics that you can pull out. Uh, partner name, uh, device name, net BIOS name, IP address, last successful time, last start time, duration, uh, the 28 day color bars, the recovery testing fields. There's over 500 different columns of information available in that management console. Um, and all of those, including some that you can't see visually, uh, can be pulled out as part of some of those um, uh, reporting service and historic API calls. Um, for that reason, uh, there's a list of column codes down here. Uh, this list of column codes lets you know that uh, um, uh, when you run the API and you're looking to get uh, uh, creation date, that column code is CD. When you want machine name, uh, that's uh, MN. Use storage, US. Uh, AP, that's, uh, do, 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 do. that's probably the account profile or the account product. I don't remember exactly. Um, but these short codes are here. Um, as you scroll down, you're going to get a uh, breakout of the column title that you would see in backup.management. You're going to see the uh, short code ID. These are legacy short codes, uh, what we've used up, used up until um, probably a year, year and a half ago. Um, and these are still in place in the product. But we've also introduced some new um, uh, column title, I'm sorry, column code IDs here as well. And the reason we did that is uh, we've added new statistics, a new backend reporting database. And uh, as we've added or expanded our data sources, Office 365 to, to be um, 
uh, certain recovery testing as well, um, it's required us to add additional columns that the old schema did not support. So uh, you can utilize the legacy short names or you can utilize the new IDs to come through and grab things like computer name, uh, I18 uh, or MN. Either one of those is going to pull the same statistic, but there are some data sources that or um, columns that only exist in the new notation. Uh, so keep that in mind, and I'll show you when we're using this notation and the structures and how you can uh, look up some of these uh, very easily without even going in here and pulling uh, up these statistics um, uh, pages. But um, those are the column codes. Here's the legacy column codes as a whole, uh, if you want to look at it without any of the new stuff in place. But uh, ideally, this is the best one here since it shows both the legacy short name and the new ID for a column code. Um, Let's see here, uh, data formats. Uh, all of the data formats inside um, uh, the API, inside of the schema, um, are uh, going to be, like I said, in, in that Unix timestamp. Um, uh, here, I think it references a, a couple different methodologies. Um, uh, actually, no, you know, it just uh, gives a high-level example. It doesn't give a tool for it. Um, you can calculate it here, uh, you know, easily by, you know, number of seconds uh, to a year, number of seconds to a month, so on and so forth. Uh, but like I said, I've already got uh, functions inside of PowerShell that'll convert these for you. Uh, so you don't need to think too hard about that one. Um, and I'll show you those examples as we go through. Size formats, when you pull data out and it's looking at total use storage or selected size of a device or how much data was sent across the wire or compressed or encrypted sizes, things of that nature, uh, we're gonna give it to you in bytes. And that is a base two notation. Uh, so it's uh, 1024 bytes to a kilobyte, 1024 kilobytes to a megabyte, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's not as simple as just moving a uh, decimal place. Um, um, you do need to use the conversion, but I do have the structure set up for you fairly easily already inside of PowerShell as well. Um, just understand that when you're passing information in, you may have to pass it in bytes or pass it in gigabytes and convert it to bytes before it would go you know, into the script as a whole. Um, other things, just short little components here. Uh, most of the calls that we're going to do from a, a REST API perspective are post uh, calls. Um, and it means that we are sending information to um, uh, the environment um, uh, and submitting information, not just a query, but submitting information, uh, making a change, and then respecting, expecting a result or a response of some sort back. Um, while some of those post calls are truly just informational calls requesting information, um, they still do use a post command as opposed to a get command. Um, some of the uh, undocumented uh, API calls that I utilize in my scripts, and I'll notate when those are uh, non-documented calls that I'm utilizing, um, some of those might actually utilize a get uh, methodology as well uh, because they're only designed or emulating what the web UI uh, at backup.management is doing, but it's not a officially supported or documented API call. Uh, the endpoint that we're talking to from an API perspective is going to be this api.backup.management slash JSON API in almost all cases. Once again, unless it's one of those undocumented um, uh, calls, and then you'll see in my examples and in my scripts, um, I'll say that there may be some unsupported um, uh, commands in there. You'll see when I'm utilizing a different endpoint uh, versus this generic uh, endpoint, okay? I think that's the high level. I do want to hit... Uh, the schema, which is right here someplace, I thought. Ah, here's the schema. Um, this schema is fairly huge. Um, you know, this is going to give a list of all of the methods and all of the required parameters and the optional parameters, and then a breakout of what kind of, of uh, data that parameter accepts. Is it a, a variable? Uh, I'm sorry, is it an integer? Is it a string? Is it uh, one of X fixed values? Um, is it always the same uh, or does it change? What kind of responses come out of here? Um, the easiest thing I found for reading um, or loading in an API like this, uh, Postman is a great tool. You can actually inject this API and, and uh, uh, look at it, read it, manage it uh, very nicely from inside of Postman. Uh, there are browser plugs and plugins as well for Firefox and Chrome. Uh, and probably the Edge version, uh, Chrome version of Edge that will allow you to um, format these and be able to search and manipulate them, uh, uh, separate the various calls from the values and the responses and so on. Uh, but this is the, the 
the the the current bible if you will for uh, api calls that are supported um, for backup dot management um, and we're going to go through a couple of these uh the first one that we're going to look at is going to be uh login i believe um so if i just search in here quickly for login um so i've got a call here where the uh, uh, method is uh, called login uh, then the parameters for this, uh, the very first parameter is name, which is a standard string, a partner name. Um, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The parameter name is partner, which is a standard string. Uh, the next uh, parameter name is username, which is also a standard string. And then finally, it's the password, uh, and that's a standard string. Um, and uh, if you submit a login call uh, with those three parameters and they're valid parameters, you're going to get out of that a list of um, or a result of user info. That's going to be the user information for that user that you've logged in with. Um, you'll get things like the uh, login level, uh, the partner, uh, uh, parent partner where this user exists, uh, when that user first logged in and last logged in and the API restrictions or user restrictions that are tied to that particular user and I'll show you all of that but um, if you don't know or don't have familiarity reading uh, uh, API schema um, knowing what is required here what you're going to pass and what you don't pass could be a little um, uh, overwhelming but uh, take a look at that and those three named variables here that we're going to utilize um, and I'll show that to you in a little bit more detail here in a few moments. Um, sample scripts. Uh, so on um, success.enable.com uh, uh, slash cookbooks, you're going to find the automation cookbook. This is where we're going to have deployment, management, monitoring, reporting, and security scripts as they relate to backup. But you're also going to have those as they relate to RMM, uh, our various security, remote control tools, the ability to install, uninstall. Um, so lots of additional scripts beyond uh, the scope of backup. So definitely worth taking a look at. Um, that is the final resting place for scripts that I'm working on or prototype scripts uh, once they've become mature uh, and adopted out uh, uh, by the community. Um, I end up moving them from my GitHub page where they're a little bit more fluid and dynamic uh, into that automation cookbook. Uh, this automation cookbook, if you want to uh, view that, uh, is available, uh, let's see, right here. Uh, so success.enable.com slash cookbooks. And you can see at the very beginning here, uh, log in to upload a script. You can submit your own versions, your own edits, your own uh, uh, modules that you create uh, here to us, whether it be in PowerShell or VB script or a batch file, an automation policy for RMM or in Central. Uh, you can drop those in here. We'll review those, approve those, and then post those into the environment. Um, um, or you can just come in here and download some of the existing. So if I come in and search for backup, uh, for instance, uh, you'll see there's 47 uh, scripts in here tied to backup. Uh, installation, uh, download and install, standalone backup manager. Uh, deploy is a, uh, uh, an AMP file. Um, redeploy, uh, cache or store credentials. Adjust or change the device product, device profile. Here's an uninstall. Uh, here's another deploy structure. Uh, there's probably a deploy for documents in here. Uh, backup upgrade. Um, so several different scripts here and you know, another five pages of those or another four pages of those uh, that you can go through. And um, when you download these, it's going to give you a little bit of, of syntax and structure, um, you know, useful for bulk removal, assignment or reassignment of backup products to devices uh, external to the backup dot management console. So if you wanted to set a product for uh, 600 devices all at the same time, you can do that with my script versus where the GUI is only going to allow you to do that for a uh, maximum of 200 devices at a time. And it's going to require you to only be able to do it inside of a single customer at a time. So um, obviously I give you a bit more flexibility uh, there with this script as an example. Um, the uh, GitHub page and uh, GitHub is broken out by category as well. Um, uh, so if you come into uh, the GitHub page, you'll see uh, categories for deployment, uh, local speed vault, migration, prototypes, the things I'm working on most recently, uh, reporting, retention, security, uh, setting settings remotely, uh, or troubleshooting. Um, and that could be adjusting your uh, uh, debug logging levels or um, uh, looking at VSS or capturing VSS errors or uh, recent backup errors and plugging those into the console or adding them into a check. Uh, so some really good scripts inside of here as I dig into these, uh, like the deployment side, 
Uh, you'll see here's a bulk generate redeployment commands. This would allow you to generate an Excel spreadsheet or a CSV file uh, with encryption keys, uh, device names, and passwords uh, for an audit if you need to hand it over to your auditor to prove that you've got access to all of these. Uh, or it can generate uh, the reinstallation PowerShell script uh, so that if you needed to redeploy this software you know, across a dozen machines, you can launch this, pick the machines you want to uh, generate the commands for, it'll give you the actual PowerShell to download and redeploy the software. Uh, deploy Backup Manager for new installations, uh, upgrades, uh, reinstallations. This is a universal PowerShell script uh, that's got a ton of different parameters in here for just about any type of scenario that you would utilize uh, the command line installer with the auto deployment functionality. Um, I, you can, you'll notice that I've taken this and I've actually carved it up into multiple AMP files. So I've got uh, deploy documents, redeploy, reuse, store, uninstall, upgrade. All of these individual AMP files are just subsets of what this uh, single PowerShell is up here. And the goal there was so you can use it with our RMM tool and Essential tool, or you could use this with uh, third-party uh, RMM and PSA applications. Uh, some occasional PDF documents in here as well, talking through the installation processes and the scripting and automation processes if you want to use it with RMM or Essential. Inside of GitHub, if you do want to download these, uh, my recommendation would be to uh, either grab the entire repository by picking up by uh, coming back to the main page uh, and using the green code button and download the zip. That'll give you the entire repository as a zip file. You can expand it out and plot the individual scripts as you need them. Uh, please review them. Uh, or if you want an individual script, such as this uh, PowerShell script here, you can write, come in here and select that script. You'll see it now from a code perspective. You can actually review it and see what you think. You could copy it out of here and paste it into your uh, uh, into your ISE as well. However, uh, it's a little bit simpler to come over here to RAW. Right click on RAW and say uh, save link as. And that'll actually let you download that as a uh, RAW PowerShell file or a RAW AMP file that can be directly uh, loaded into your environment. Um, I do uh, increment the versions as well here. So as I upload or a new version of the deploy backup manager script or the AMP files, I will increment this version number versus just changing things inside of the script. Uh, that way, if you look at your repository, or your copy or your linked version, uh, you'll be able to see that, oh, I've got version 20, uh, 20, not version 21. Maybe I want to grab that. Uh, Postman. Um, so the Postman application. Um, uh, this is available for download from postman.com slash downloads. There is a free version uh, that you have that has some limited use or limited scalability, uh, but you can utilize this for teams, share your work and your code and build your APIs and all of your testing and automation through uh, this application um, and uh, have a shared workspace or a shared uh, development dashboard uh, at some of their uh, licensed price points, uh, I think uh, annual or monthly subscriptions. Um, so it is a nice tool, but you don't necessarily have to buy into the tool in order to utilize it for, you know, things like I'm discussing here. Uh, I am utilizing the free version. I use it for individual API testing or prototyping of the API uh, call, uh, stringing them together uh, in, in some cases. Uh, it does allow you to store your credentials and store your results from one API call as a variable that you could reuse, uh, string together with the next API call and the next API call. Uh, so it can read data from an external CSV file and pull that in, uh, in the, what they call a runner command. Uh, I'll show that to you in the partner management section, the customer management section, uh, or uh, a module today. Um, but it doesn't really offer a good output. So if you need to output data to CSV, things like that, um, using the PowerShell components of the wrappers I've built, uh, it's going to be a much better approach um, and just more scalable as a whole. Um, I'll use this for the one-offs prototype it, make sure I didn't, uh, it's working as I expect it before I wrap it into a uh, PowerShell or a Apple script environment. PowerShell Visual Studio, I talked through most of this, I think, uh, on the earlier slide. Um, I see Visual Code as a good alternate to PowerShell ICE or a replacement for PowerShell ICE. Uh, there are some other nicer tools out there with a lot of GUI development and things of that nature. Um, don't necessarily take my choices uh, as your choices. If you are preferring Python, then um, by all means, go that route. If you've got a different development environment you prefer, go that route. Um, I will show you the plugins that I utilize inside of Visual Studio Code, however, uh, that make it uh, work nicely uh, with uh, the latest version or multiple versions of PowerShell uh, simultaneously. It was the easiest for me, as I said, to deploy 
um, in environments uh, given that the majority of our backup clients are on uh, Windows Server or Windows Workstations environments. Um, and then, you know, every machine is going to have at least a PowerShell 2.0 now if it's a supported version, a supported uh, Windows OS, or at least, uh, you know, probably a PowerShell 3 or you get to Windows 10, it's now PowerShell 5. Um, uh, there's an open uh, maybe open source is the right word. There is a, a universal version of PowerShell now. I think PowerShell 7 or 7.01 is available. Um, so there are Mac and Linux versions now that you can utilize for, for PowerShell. While they're not default, uh, and I don't utilize them or develop for them actively, uh, the fact that I could run it across any of those platforms is um, of interest to me. Okay. Uh, there's an extensive online code library here, and there's modules out there to do just about anything. Um, I'll show you some modules that I download and use in my scripts. Um, things to convert to Excel from CSV file or to merge uh, tables and merge Excel uh, environments. Um, you know, it's just much easier to utilize stuff that's already been built and, and uh, vetted versus trying to rebuild everything uh, from scratch. Uh, so, um, Google is your friend, definitely. Before you try to build it raw uh, with PowerShell, take a quick look to see if somebody else has already solved that problem. And there's probably 10 people that have solved it in, in you know, 15 different ways. And those final additional tools, the Epic Time Converter, the JSON Formatter, um, uh, I'll uh, bring up that uh, uh, Time Converter and the Formatter here, just so you guys can see that real quick. So yeah, um, so the current uh, Epoch Time is uh, this. Um, if I want to take a time and convert it, um, so, uh, you know, this timestamp right here, rel uh, relative, rel uh, relatively, it was five hours ago. Uh, that was at uh, 12.45 p.m. GMT time or 8.45 a.m. Um, here, uh, U.S. East Coast or uh, uh, GMT minus four daylight savings time, uh, daylight savings summertime. There we go. Um, it works out rather nice to utilize this. I can't look at these numbers and determine is that in the future? Is that really far into the past? Um, and everything is going to have that kind of timestamp based on when it had it when it ran, when it's scheduled to run, when it's set to expire, those kind of things. So um, utilizing the these, either something like this to grab something on the fly uh, or uh, the uh, various uh, PowerShell functions that I've got that'll do the conversions for you. Um, you know. You'll, you'll definitely want to standardize on one or two of those methodologies. Uh, the other one is the JSON formatter. Uh, the JSON formatter, it's just a, a, a nice quick copy and paste. So if you grab a JSON output, uh, drop it into here, it will, and hit process, it will reformat this into uh, the template that you desire. So if it's compacted and down and, and the spaces are not there and the um, uh, line breaks are not there and it's not very readable, uh, dropping it in here and hitting uh, convert or a process will convert it to whatever structure template you like. It will also compare it against the JSON specification. So you can pick a specification that you're working with uh, and it will validate it against that specification. Does it meet the spec? Uh, and if there are things that it can fix, it will attempt to fix those and identify what those fixes were. Um, you know, uh, a, trailing, a trailing comma, uh, missing quotations, uh, incorrect bracket structures, things of that nature. It will repair or and for, prepare for you, and this is really nice if you're grabbing something out of a browser in the developer mode where you've looked at an API and you've got the the, the details. Pull it into here, have it formatted so it's human readable, um, and then you can tweak and adjust it. Drop it directly into Py into uh, um, uh, Postman to uh, prototype and evaluate, or drop it directly into um, uh, Visual Studio Code inside of a wrapper for uh, for PowerShell. Or sorry, inside of a wrapper for um, JSON. Um, so straight into authentication. Um, authentication perspective, we're going to drop into that um, uh, Postman environment, and we're going to utilize that API call that we looked at for the initial login. Um, this is going to get us access to the backup management console. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of troubleshooting there too. We're going to break a couple things. Um, I'm going to share um, uh, some passwords with you guys as well. So you guys are going to see a clear text password uh, for a reporter level login that I have. Um, and uh, uh, that's normally a bad practice, uh, but I want to show you how it's used inside of the uh, API, inside of uh, Postman, how we can store it as variables, and then how we're going to utilize it as a uh, stored encrypted credential later in some of my more advanced scripts, um, because obviously you don't want to embed uh, passwords and credentials into your scripting environment. Um, you don't want to store them any place that somebody can get access to them or utilize them, um, you know, without your without your knowledge, without your permission. 
So uh, let's start here. Um, this is the documentation link that we're going to utilize. Uh, we've already been in here. Uh, no, actually, we haven't been in here. Uh, so I'll pull this one up. And I'll show you the different user permissions uh, when we get to that portion. And we're going to talk about uh, API authentication, uh, making sure that your user roles have access to the APIs. You should always be using least privilege access. Uh, so your users may not have API access. Maybe you want to only enable for one or two select users. Um, API calls do bypass the 2FA. So um, you obviously don't want to have API control turned on for everybody, just a very select set, or maybe even not for your normal login users, but create a separate email address and a separate user only for the API calls um, uh, that you control with a much, much more complex password. Um, still though, least privilege access, if you are running reports and you don't need super user level access, uh, then there's no reason to generate an API that's a user that's going to have super user roles. Just set it up with supporter or read only type of reporter level role uh, and use that for uh, this type of environment. Um, so we're going to use that, the, create those user credentials. Um, passes through in through the, uh, the login, it's going to respond with a visa. This visa is what's used for uh, further authentication and daisy chaining scripts together or uh, API calls together to get beyond the login. So we'll log in, we'll get a visa. The visa is good for, uh, I believe, up to 15 minutes. Um, so we can use that now to uh, trigger additional API calls and um, those will generate a new visa. We'll utilize that visa to string along to the next call and the next call and the next call, allowing us to um, log in, generate a partner, query that partner for more information and make adjustments to that partner and now then go in and get a UID and start adding devices to that partner uh, all with that, only that one initial uh, authentication string and then as soon as we stop utilizing the API calls then that uh, uh, visa will start to uh, time out after a uh, 10 or 15 minute uh, window. Okay. So with Postman, um, what I'm looking at here um, is uh, an environment where I can load an API in, or I can create a collection of API calls. Uh, you can set up environment variables, which are going to store a, a variable, a different, different environment variables for different purposes, uh, and then you control those variables and how they're pulled in, whether it's something you introduce in up front or something you scrape out of a script response. Um, uh, it's got monitors and, and recorded history and, and, and runners that will ex, uh, execute against CSV files and um, it'll capture cookies. Um, it, it is a really a full advanced suite. I'm only using a very small percentage of its functionality. Um, so uh, definitely something to look at and play with um, and, and see if it would be beneficial for you. Uh, what I've done though, is I've created a separate container here called Bootcamp with just a small set of APIs that we're gonna look at today. Um, and I'm going to start with um, uh, I want to start with this uh, API right here. Um, so this is that uh, login uh, um, uh, method, uh, JSON RPC uh, API call. Uh, it is a post uh, command, not a get, not a put. Um, it is talking to the standard uh, api.backup.management slash JSON API URL. Um, so all of those standards that we talked about a little earlier. Um, there are three uh, items you need to successfully log in here um, for uh, to get that visa that we can utilize. Uh, so if I come in here and hit send right now and push this call up to this URL, um, I'm going to get a response back, unknown partner, username, or bad password. It's because I passed a null value for my password here, okay? So um, here is my call. Uh, notice that it's structured, nice and formatted with proper tabbing and so on. If it doesn't look right in here, you can always drop into that JSON format or have it formatted and then paste it back into here. Um, that'll help you understand, are my, is my bracket structure correct? Um, but I'm missing the password. Um, so uh, what I wanna do is I wanna grab that password. Instead of me going and grabbing it and pasting it in, I've just got another copy of the same API call here. Uh, this has the password embedded into it. Uh, uh, as I said, this is a read-only environment, um, and I'll be blowing these accounts away post-session, um, so I'm not really concerned about showing you guys a, a read-only password for my lab environment for, you know, this uh, uh, boot camp series. Um, the environment here now, if I go to hit send, let's see what this is going to do for me. Um, so I got a different error this time. So it didn't say that it was incomplete or that it had an error. I got a, uh, an error due to API authentication is restricted. 
So that means that inside of my backup dot management console, I don't have appropriate rights to talk or communicate via API. So now we're going to go to backup dot management. Uh, let's see, that is going to be one of my browsers here. This is my HH Computing IT, my sample MSP. So now I have a super user account uh, that uh, has uh, API authentication enabled. Uh, and then I've got a read only account down, here, account down here, which is a supporter level role that uh, currently API authentication is disabled. And that's what caused that error we saw just a moment ago. I'm gonna come in here and edit that and turn on API authentication. Um, I would recommend you look at your user roles inside of your console to make sure that you don't have API authentication enabled where you don't need it. Um, you know, really no sense there. And as that does bypass 2FA, um, it could open you up to risk with, um, you know, a bad actor that uh, does manage to get into uh, uh, into your environment or uh, if you've got any type of password reuse or a technician that's not, uh, uh, you know, guarding his uh, credentials very closely, um, you know, that could be uh, a potential security risk. Uh, so I've got the, the roles I want to work with now. Let's uh, step back out of here and uh, get to Postman, and we're gonna send that same uh, command again. So I got a different result this time. So it did authenticate, and it pulls back my user information for the user that logged in. Um, so uh, the email address, the first login time, this is um, a little small here. I don't think I can make it much bigger though. Uh, first login time, and that's that Unix timestamp. First time I've logged in is this user. Uh, first name, any flags, so, uh, allow API authentication. Uh, uh, last name or, or uh, uh, surname, um, user ID, last login time, so first and last login time, so you can see how long they've been a user, uh, the name, uh, um, login name, as, as well as login email address, uh, so those are mimicked or mirrored uh, today uh, now that we require an email login. We used to allow you a separate named user login or alternate email login. But tied to two-factor authentication and email resets and things of that nature, uh, forcing it to be an email user uh, actually makes a lot of sense. The partner ID. This is the ID of HEH Computing IT. So the partner is 229433. We're going to use that a little, a little bit later in some of the scripts. Uh, the password is listed as null. That's because we don't uh, grab the password and redisplay it here in the output of the results. Um, um, so we just get a, a null. If the phone number were tied into this, um, sometimes people will put this in here, especially if they are um, uh, doing the 2FA on their mobile device and they want somebody to be able to reach out and contact them. Uh, they'll drop their phone number in or other contact information into the user um, environment and then the role ID. So uh, supported level role is role ID 5. And there is a uh, PowerShell, I'm sorry, API command here. It says enumerate users, which will tell you each role ID and then the level, uh, the name level tied to it. So we've got a lot of those cross-reference lookups that will give you a name to an ID uh, for things like uh, country uh, or data center location or um, uh, 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 production state and so on. Um, additional information down here as we go down a little bit more, uh, the title, if you've introduced a title into your user, um, two-factor authentication status, uh, if it is enabled for the, for the particular user, you'll see enabled or disabled here. Um, so it's a great way to come in and look and see um, if you were just doing enumeration of users versus the login of users, you could pull this for all of your users and then determine, oh, they haven't logged in in six months automatically demote their accounts or even purge their accounts if they haven't logged in an X amount of time or if they've never logged in and enabled the two-factor authentication, you could purge those accounts or drop them down to pure read-only capabilities, you know, things of that nature. So um, a lot of power you could do here just through a little bit of automation. Um, now, uh, this is cumbersome. Obviously, you don't want to be working with partner name, username, and password inside of this field all the time, um, especially considering it's the security aspects aspects and the risks of you know showing all of these pieces here out um, so I've got a third variation of this uh, API call right down here and instead of using uh, uh, hard-coded uh, uh, items I've got variables uh, so um, uh, curly bracket curly bracket uh, and a variable name uh, within the closed brackets is going to introduce uh, it uh, or request it to look up a variable and it's going to pull that variable from the um, uh, environment my current environment is HH Computing IT. It's right here in this little dropdown. I can pick, you know, no environment or pick an existing environment that I've had configured. Um, and I'm working with the read-only environment. So if I hit the um, eyeball on that, you can see what your current value is. So my current visa 
uh, that has been retrieved uh, that's used for that ongoing authentication is here. I've got a timestamp that's pulled, uh, so it pulls a, a current timestamp in. Uh, let's see what else I've got in here. I've got my partner name, my username, and my password are all in here. Um, so I can use this call and just hit send, and I'll get that exact same authentication. Um, and um, uh, you'll see the, the login time here and, and uh, um, you know, those components. So uh, last login time, first login time. So good information. Um, by changing these environments, you can switch to a different user. If you have an environment for a read-only user, a super user, an administrative user, and be able to test your script that way without having to go in and type all the different passwords in, just change your environment out. And I'm going to do that here in a minute uh, for some of the things that I want to do because this supporter level user doesn't have ad partner rights. Uh, when we get to the ad partner section, I'll, I'll show you that uh, in more detail. So the question is, how do I work with these variables? Um, so I set them up here, uh, and you came in and you would uh, edit uh, your uh, environment, and you just add a new variable. So uh, the variable is here. Uh, what's the initial value? What's the current value? And you can drop those in uh, either in quotes or out of quotes, depending on what your script might need. Uh, if you don't put quotes here, you might need to put quotes around the uh, variable placeholder uh, in the script really your choice on what you prefer as a uh, as a syntax or not. Uh, here I've got quotes around all the strings um, uh, in here. Uh, see, we can uh, close that. Let's get back over to here. Um, so the fact that I've got uh, these variables are nice. Um, I ran the script. It generated a, a visa down here. Now this visa is as important as your password. For the next 15 minutes, this visa gets you into the backup environment at this uh, supporter level role. So, um, you know, don't obscure and hide your your credentials and then turn around and give your visa freely to anybody and, and present it to the world. Um, you want to make sure that you're uh, storing this and keeping this as secure as you would a password or an encryption key. OK, um, and it is a fairly long string. Um, what I'm doing here um, is I'm taking this visa and I'm capturing it when this job runs, and I'm storing it as an environment variable. Um, the first variables, I started out by having them in the environment, and it reads them when it runs. But to store a variable that's generated as part of the, the initial runtime, I have a little bit of code sitting right here under tests. Um, so uh, the code here uh, that we're utilizing is saying uh, postman.environment.set. Uh, so we're setting a postman environment variable, uh, we're going to call the environment variable visa, um, and we're going to get the, the data for the variable from the postman response dot JSON um, under the visa header uh, or visa category, I guess. Um, that is the, the postman response, which is the response down here. If I come down and look at the response, I've got my response, start at the first bracket, um, and uh, one in is my visa location so it grabs this result uh, and stores that as that environment variable um, in here this current value okay um, it also grabs um, and sets a variable called time and it goes in and uh, looks at the p at the postman response uh, the json result dot result dot last login time uh, so we'll follow that down uh, result dot result dot uh, last login time and it grabs this uh, uh, data and creates that and adds it into uh, this current va value right here. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let's see, question wise. Uh, so, Craig, don't I want to use, um, don't you want to use the read only user? Yes, yeah, so I am using the read only user here, uh, Craig. So, this is um, the, the read only login user, definitely. Um, I do have a, uh, a bootcamp user here, which is going to be a super user. I'll use it here in a minute. Um, uh, that we'll use to generate um, some partners and do some other management. Uh, but this guy right here is is definitely read-only purposes. So I've got this visa, um, and um, uh, I can log in. I can do some various things with it. Anything that's statistical where I'm pulling data, it's going to work pretty well for me. Uh, but if I tried to come in and add a partner um, and, and uh, run this with the current visa that I have, I'm going to get an error. It says operations restricted by the user role. Uh, that's because the current supporter level of that user does not have the rights to uh, run the add partner uh, method. That's going to require a higher level of security. Okay. 
So uh, we want to move now into uh, the next module here, adding customers. Uh, we're going to utilize that authentication that we uh, uh, component that we just did. Uh, we'll string that along and start to add some customers. We'll elevate our permissions uh, so that we can um, uh, actually add customer uh, environments. Um, but we're going to take it a little bit further as well. We're going to uh, not just add uh, one customer, but we're going to use a CSV file uh, and uh, do a, a runner function instead of Postman so we could bulk add uh, new end customers. This would be great if you were to bring on uh, you know, a new uh, large set of customers who wanted to uh, use this to maybe add devices or apply settings. Um, being able to read from a CSV opens up a lot of possibilities. So instead of having variables that you read out of the environment, it's going to read those variables from an external CSV file that you uh, point uh, Postman to. Obviously, we can definitely do that inside of PowerShell as well, uh, but I found that um, sometimes it can be quicker just to uh, uh, do a down and dirty inside of Postman versus, you know, writing the script and building it, the extra error checking uh, into an external script, unless it's something you're going to use, uh, you know, on a daily basis. Um, We'll also look at some of the uh, read-only type of functions where we can get ch uh, child customers or get customer info by name. Um, instead of punching in a customer ID, like this 229433, uh, which is my HH computing, uh, we'll instead pump in the uh, partner name and we'll have it do a lookup and pull statistics that way. Because um, you're not always going to know, know the uh, partner ID, but you would know the partner name that you could use for a lookup. And that's great when you're trying to you know, set up auto deployment or, or new configurations. Hey, what was that partner again? Uh, so we'll take you through those approaches. Uh, let's see, we're going to go back into uh, Postman here. Um, I'm going to change my environment out uh, just a little bit. So I want to go out of my read-only environment, and I'm going to go into my bootcamp environment here. Um, and just by changing that now, I'm using a different set of credentials uh, stored in this environment. Uh, so I can come up here now and uh, uh, choose to uh, log in with these variables, and uh, we'll hit send. And now I've logged in. But I'm logged in as my bootcamp user, which is that super user that I elevated a little while ago. Um, so having that user in place, I can now come down here to add partner. Um, and uh, this is my uh, syntax for add partner. Um, okay, so if you look in here, what do we have? We've got um, a uh, post command to the normal JSON API. The method is add partner, the parameters. Uh, there's partner info, and under that, there's the parent ID, the container, where we're going to add these new end customers underneath, and they're adding end customers here. Um, so we've specified that specifically. This is what you're going to do mostly as a MSP or a reseller. You're going to be adding in customers underneath your environment. Um, if I've got any distributors on the line um, and you're utilizing this structure, uh, you would be adding uh, resellers and possibly end customers uh, if you were helping to, uh, to bulk load for, um, uh, for your endpoints. Um, service type and child service types, uh, all-inclusive is typically the default here. That means it's hosted or stored uh, in the Enable Cloud in a regional data center, uh, typically within country or in region uh, from your location. Um, the other option here is um, software only, uh, and that's going to be uh, when you're hosting your own storage nodes and providing your own uh, backup uh, storage infrastructure. Uh, the name of the partner. Uh, this does have to be uh, unique uh, globally through the multi-tenant environment, although um, you can obviously expand upon this. It is case sensitive as well, so uh, some creative use of punctuation and capitalization. Uh, you can get just about anything in here without running any type of conflicts, uh, short of acronyms. You know, if your company or partner name is, is you know, uh, uh, AAP or AAC, there probably is another one like that someplace else. Um, so acronyms really don't make a lot of sense. Um, if you're going to utilize acronyms, uh, think about punctuation, think about uh, hyphenating them or colons and other variations with uh, their site location or region or customer ID number or whatever it may be in addition to the acronym. The production state, uh, in trial, in production are going to be the two most common. Um, if you're in production, you can start new customers in trial, giving you them a 30-day uh, window to evaluate the software. Um, if you start them, if you're in production, you start them in a production, they become billable on day one. Uh, obviously, if you're in trial state, all you can create are uh, containers in trial state underneath your account uh, to start. 
the location ID and the device country. Uh, these are part of that storage location guarantee that we offer to ensure that data is uh, uh, respecting data sovereignty um, uh, borders. Uh, so, for instance, if it's if you specify it's a U.S. device, um, then it's going to utilize a uh, location ID of 18. It's going to keep that data within uh, U.S. borders or Canadian borders or U.K. or E.U. regions. Now, the E.U. is a little bit unique in the sense that it might go to the Netherlands, it might go to Germany, it might go to France. Uh, um, if you specify France, we're going to try to utilize the French data center. We might fail over or roll over to um, a data center in um, uh, another part of the EU if there were availability or space issues, uh, but we're going to try to res remain in the country of origin, uh, worst case within the EU or a data center in the EU as a whole. Um, legal company name could be different. In this case, I'm using the same one for both. Uh, you can drop the the uh, post address in here, so address, city, state, country, lots of uh, variations here. You notice I've got null values in here for a lot of these are just double quotes. Um, they're not all required, uh, and there are additional values you can drop in here as well. Um, I'll show you the schema and the documentation page here in just a second so you can see what some of the additional variations are. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just uh, ensure that we uh, are authenticated. Um, so let's see, I did get authentication, yes. I've got a visa that's sitting there. It's you know a couple minutes old. So I'm going to go create uh, this partner now and see if I can. So um, I got a response. I got a result, a result, a result, uh, and I got a partner ID. This is the new ID for the new end customer that was created and a new visa. This visa is updated uh, with the current timestamp, so it's not going to expire uh, for another 15 minutes. Um, I can then grab this visa. Um, which uh, I'm not doing as part of this test, but I could grab this visa as another test and pull it into my next command if I wanted to and just daisy chain those commands and now going deeper and deeper into um, a series of functions. Um, in the uh, JSON guide here, uh, we've got uh, authorization, which is right here. Um, and I've already shown you where the uh, enable the API authentication uh, function is. Um, and you know, here is the, the basic API call, partner and a username and password. Uh, here's the sample results that we see. Um, but there are also options in here for device management, customer management, storage management, user management, and those custom columns that I talked about a little earlier. Uh, we're gonna skip down to customer management. And you'll see examples under customer management for adding customers, what we just did. So adding a new customer. Um, the various uh, required parameters and optional parameters. Um, so when I mentioned level, uh, we created an end customer, but depending on your level, um, if you're a distributor, you can create anything lower. If you're a sub-distributor, anything lower. If a reseller or MSP, anything lower. Um, so that's how that works. Uh, your service type, uh, all inclusive or software only. Uh, child service type, this is what your customers underneath you are, are able to uh, provide. Uh, state being in production or in trial. Uh, location ID, these are the various country codes. Um, if you want to get a full list of country codes, uh, the API call to enumerate locations will output a list of the current uh, IDs and the corresponding uh, country name that's tied to that. Uh, under company, uh, you've got um, uh, uh, post address, so you can have all of this various information around a uh, um, uh, around the uh, the company uh, company uh, subset. Um, here's that sample request, something you might send up, and then the sample response. So um, while I'm showing you some of this in Postman, you know, here is just the raw uh, JSON call. Um, and uh, if you, you know, you grab this result and you take it into the JSON formatter, and I paste it into here and I hit process, here is a nice cleaned up or, or formatted version I could work with. I could tweak and change these different commands. Uh, drop in my parent level, pick the different structures that I want, change the name and the country, and I've got my call that I need uh, to utilize. Obviously, uh, replacing the visa here with either uh, copy and paste from the uh, authentication command or use a variable to pull it in from the environment. Um, so let's take this one just a little bit further, continue to build upon what, we, what we've seen, what we've learned here. Um, I created this partner, and he's going to show up inside of my management console. Uh, I come over here to customer management. I can see this new partner for bootcamp is created with 30 days left, and uh, I can come in and edit him. 
Um, you can see when it was created, the customer user ID, this is the unique string that's tied to auto deployment. Um, if I deploy with this string, it automatically adds new devices under this container. Um, and we can request this ID uh, through the API. Uh, we can come in and reset it if we need to, so we can prevent or limit the ability to install into this container, simply turn off automated deployment as a whole. Uh, company information, uh, we dropped in, the legal name is the same as the other name. Uh, the country, we didn't specify a state, so it's uh, just defaulted to the top, uh, but we can come down and clean that up and say, no, these guys are in Indiana and any other items that we want to. Add in contacts, add in uh, many CRM notes here, and even turn on custom branding. So most of this can be done through the, the API structure as well. You'll see different calls for any of these items. Um, if you want to know what call that is and make things a little bit simpler versus searching the schema, um, while you're in here, all you really need to do um, is, let me turn it on here, hit F11, oops, sorry, not F11, F12. I'm going to open up my developer view. And I'll come over here and I'll clear the environment. Uh, let's go to the custom branding tab. So I'm in custom branding here and I want to enable branding and hit save. And we'll come out here and look at my um, uh, networking tab. And you can see JSON RPC v1. Um, I've got various calls in here. Let's see what this one is. Uh, header, uh, backup.management, uh, JSON RPC one, post call. Uh, we'll come down here and see what we were doing. Um, this was a call to enumerate child partners. Um, so it sent uh, method numerate child partners uh, with uh, parameters, uh, partner ID so-and-so, range and offset so-and-so, filter sort by so-and-so with these fields, sorted by level and name for this partner ID. And it came back with a response of this uh, JSON call or this JSON response right here. So we got a lot of information all in a single string. So you can see here where being able to select uh, that string and move that over into the JSON formatter uh, like I have here. Let's clear that, paste that in, and hit process. Uh, so it is valid format. Now I get my actual structure in something that's a little bit more human readable uh, than what I got out of the developer mode inside of my browser. Now that wasn't the exact call I was expecting to see, but there were several JSON calls here that happened all at the same time. Um, so uh, let's see what other calls had happened. Uh, set partner web branding. Okay, so that was the method, set partner web branding. I can now search my schema for that particular method, uh, but I can see here that it passes the ID, uh, JSON RPC, it passes the method, it passes some parameters, so partner ID, and then it turns on the web branding components. Um, so it's got a name um, and a component and a value, a name, component, value, name, value, name, value, name, value for each of those individual uh, components. So what's the menu active color? Or what's the um, uh, background color? What's the main color? If you know these, you can go through and set custom branding for all of your devices all at one time. Uh, or even modify them individually based on a uh, CSV file, if you like. Um, so being able to grab this information and work with it, um, super helpful. Um, I could just come right up here and um, uh, say view source, uh, grab the entire uh, payload. Like so. Um, do that same type of structure in here in my JSON formatter. Drop this down and we'll paste. Um, uh, so it didn't like that. I missed something, probably my copy and paste. It was expecting a close bracket at the end, uh, insert of missing quotes, escaped, unescaped characters. So it fixed a couple errors, errors that I had but it did do a pretty good job. So I've got my uh, method, my params, my partner ID, my branding properties, my different uh, values and settings for each of those. Um, 
and down here I've got uh, what looks like possibly the error so it was able to fix what it could uh, but still that formatting structure can be very helpful for you hopefully that's uh, something you guys are useful um, okay uh, where are we now we've been through those pieces we created the users we went in and looked at the developer view we saw how to use that in the JSON formatter um, if I get back into Postman um, that was adding one partner and that's nice but I just hard-coded most of these variables in here right I guess I could have changed the location ID here to a variable and the country to a variable and then inserted those into the environment but even then that's still just a one-for-one -one change it doesn't really help me so we're going to do add partners from CSV file so I'm going to take this configuration and modify it a little bit so that it is using a visa variable a customer name variable and these two locations and a city variable so these three variables have been re have been, been entered and replaced the hard-coded information okay um, we're going to use that uh, with a uh, CSV file. Let me find that. Uh, with this CSV file right here, and this is uh, uh, Notepad++. I've, I've created a CSV file that has a header for customer name and city. Uh, these are case sensitive and they match with the variables uh, in Postman. And then I've got company 1000, 1001, 1002, all the way up through 1021 and the city that that customer or company or branch office exists in um, uh, here. So we'll use this and we'll bulk upload or bulk create partners in the console utilizing this. So to do that, um, I'm gonna come down here to the runner function um, and I'll click that. Um, so now it wants me to drag in a collection or a folder from the sidebar to get started. So I'm gonna go over here and grab my uh, add partner from CSV uh, collection um, and that brought in the whole collection of scripts that I'm working through today and I don't want to do all these scripts I don't want to run all of them it's going to cause some problems so I'm going to deselect them and I'm going to pick just two scripts I'm going to pick the one that authenticates to generate my uh, original uh, visa or token and, and have that 15 minute timeout and I'm going to pick the ad partner from CSV um, technically I could just do this ad partner from CSV if I had a valid visa and I was going to do a script that was going to run and be completed in less than 15 minutes, but I wanna be doubly sure that I don't time out. So I'm gonna guarantee on every cycle, I reauthenticate and then add my partner. Um, so how do I pick the CSV file? I go over here to select file. Um, I navigate to uh, the CSV file, which is right here. It reads it, says there's 22 line items in that, uh, in that uh, container, in that uh, uh, CSV. Um, I can set a, a five second delay or five millisecond delay here so I don't overload uh, the cloud with API requests. Uh, I've already selected the file so I can do a preview and I can see here are all my iterations. Here's the company name and here's the city or sorry, customer name in the city. Uh, so it's going to go through and read that information and drop it in. And I don't want to do all 22 of these. I'm only going to create, let's say, seven of those. Um, because I want to be able to test the functionality and, and, and look at the details. So because I'm going to test the functionality, I'm going to save the responses. So that way we can see what the response to the API calls are when this runs. And then I'm going to tick that, uh, kick that off. So now I've got my seven iterations identified over here, and it's going to run through each of those iterations, one after the other. It's going to do the first uh, API command to authenticate, and then the second API command to add the partner from the CSV. Uh, now it reiterates and goes through the second in the list, the third in the list, the fourth in the list. So if these fail or are successful, it's going to give me the results here in the add partner or in the authenticate um, script. So I will hit add partner and I can look at the request URL. So it's requesting, uh, oops, I guess I should wait till it's a little closer to done so I can see, so it doesn't scroll. But um, let's see, I want request URL. So there's the URL we requested. Here's the header uh, with the visa. Um, here is the body. Uh, so this is the um, uh, parameters we sent in the script or in the uh, call. And notice it replaced the variables with company 1000 um, and so on, Boston. So that's good. Um, uh, and it proceeds to the next and the next and the next and the next. So it's went through that full iteration. Because the first one didn't fail, I'm gonna assume that they all worked. Uh, but we're going to go out and look at that again. Let's see. We'll go back to customer management. Company 1000 through 1006. Those are my seven entries. They all came in as trial. 
if I come in here and edit one of these, like uh, 1004, go to company, um, that's in San Francisco. Um, I didn't specify a country uh, or a state, so I'll come in and set that to California, and I'll hit save, and it's updated. Um, lots of practical uses there. Anytime you want to reiterate through a structure and uh, drop them in, um, and nice, quick, and easy that you can do through uh, through Postman. Okay, um, so we're not going to delete those right now. I'll clean those up for my uh, next session here a little bit later. Um, coming back in here. Uh, let's work on a couple other credentials, uh, or sorry, a couple, a couple other commands that are in this get customer or get modified partner um, category. So get child partners. So get child partners is going to give me a numerate or a list of partners under a given partner ID. Um, so I know that 229433 is the HEH computing ID because I got that when I did my first authentication uh, under uh, that uh, 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 reseller account. Um, so I'm going to use that. Um, I'm going to set an offset. Um, so I can start at my offset at zero, meaning grab the very, very first uh, list of results, give me only five uh, child partners or end customers underneath uh, this environment, sort them by level and by name. So it'll give me all of the end customers and then it'll give them to me alphabetically. It's going to return a series of fields. So it's going to return fields zero through 24. Um, now, you might ask what those fields are, and those fields are all kinds of information around the uh, address, the location, the parameters, the last time they logged in, uh, the last time they were created when the trial started, a bunch of different pieces of information. Those can be enumerated to get the full um, list of what they, they all reference to. Um, but I'm going to return all of you so you can see the examples. Uh, we're passing a visa uh, as a variable. It's JSON RPC. Notice that these are at the bottom of my script as opposed to the top of the script, like you see in some cases. Doesn't matter as long as my bracket structures are closed out and, and things are listed properly. Um, so we've got a visa, I think it's still working. I'm gonna hit send and see if I can get an enumeration. So I got my enumeration, um, JSON RPC result. There's actually 18 children underneath uh, this branch, but it should have only returned uh, five based on my request here. Uh, so let's see, I've got uh, AWS uh, EC2, I've got um, uh, to uh, 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 backup nerd lab, I've got Canadian site, I've got um, uh, company 1000, uh, company 1001, uh, and then and then um, just my parent HEH computing IT. So I get that, and then the five that are underneath it, uh, a new visa that I can use for chaining purposes and so on. Um, here's my UID. This is my string to deploy into that container. Uh, up here is my UID for this container. Um, so these unique partner or customer UIDs are used for auto deployments. Um, so I got that as one of the results. When the trial started, when the trial expired, all in that Unix timestamp. This particular partner is currently in trial state. I could filter and sort on this to say, give me just devices that are par partners that are in trial or that the trial has expired and now in production or that are doing software only or doing all inclusive or um, don't have auto deployment or do have auto deployment turned on through a UID. Um, so you get pretty creative in what you pull out here. Uh, this is just the API equivalent of coming in here and saying uh, customer management, um, uh, HEH uh, computing IT, and you get your list of partners and then the various details by dr drilling down in deeper. Okay. Uh, we're going to put all of these together uh, as we get a little bit deeper into this. Um, uh, I made a, a specific point of pointing out this parent ID or this uh, partner ID here, this 229433 a little earlier. You don't always know what the ID is of a particular partner, especially if it's a sub-partner underneath your container. You just know the name. Um, so we're going to use the next call here, which is get, uh, sorry, get partner info by name. Um, this is a really, really short call. Um, so it's uh, method is get partner info. The pr only parameter you passed here is the name of the uh, partner itself. It is case sensitive um, and uh, doesn't support any wildcard. So it's the exact partner name that you're looking for. Um, so here if I want to look up HEH um, uh, CA for Canada, I will hit send. And I get all of my details for the HEH Canada. It's in the uh, Canadian country. Uh, from a data center perspective, 
my connect y external code equals hehca um, name is hehca it's in production here's the partner uid for automated deployment we'll use the string in a little while to deploy into that container and automatically create a new device okay so yeah we're ready to start in on the client deployment side so for client deployment um I've got a lot of, of pre-existing work out there that you can utilize. So you don't need to build any new deployment on your own. Uh, my GitHub page has got backup scripts, uh, full deployment section with automation manager policies for RMM and Central um, uh, that are our tools. I've got PowerShell scripts that are available for third-party tools. I've worked for uh, worked with them on Kaseya and ConnectWise and Ninja and um, uh, a handful of others um, using our deployment structures, okay? Um, I'm just wrapping the command line uh, deployment components uh, in, uh, around, uh, inside of PowerShell. That way you've got one script uh, that does either a single function or one script that can be used to pass multiple functions based on the, the specified parameters. Um, those are already preloaded into the cookbook and on my GitHub page. Um, here's the link to the command line installer um, and from a command line perspective uh, let me get uh, this up here um, client tool command line uh, we'll show you a little bit about what we're passing here and how this kind of works out um, so you can download a backup manager um, oh, that's not the one i'm looking for i want uh, command line Backup user roles, command line installer. That's this one right here. Ah, so regular installation of the backup manager. Uh, regular installation now is what we call automated deployment. And you can do a deployment as a regular install or you can uh, uh, do a silent install um, uh, behind the scenes. Um, you know, if you go through the normal GUI and you click servers and workstations and you pick a uh, uh, deployment uh, customer container um, and then the OS type and then you say backup professional or backup documents what you ultimately end up with um, is a, um, a unique file name that you can download and it'll have an alphanumeric GUID um, uh, customer UID in that uh, file name that means that installer is named or keyed specifically to work for a particular end customer maybe it has a profile embedded in it as well um, for example, here you can see um, this uh, demo backup manager pound. This is the partner UID. And this is the profile ID between the second set of pound signs .exe or uh, .pkg or .run file, depending on whether it's Mac or Linux uh, deployment. So I can take this single installer and, and set it up in uh, uh, third-party software deployment. And every time I run this installer, it's going to create a brand new device. Uh, and automatically use uh, the NetBIOS name to add it under that container in the backup.management console. Um, if this installer got out of your control, all you need to do is reset or change this partner UID, and it doesn't break any of the existing installations, but it would prevent this installer from working for new installations. Um, so you don't want to change anything between the pound signs in here. You want to preserve this file name exactly like it is. Alternately, though, if you just download the normal generic backup manager installer, uh, which is uh, uh, MXB uh, uh, version number uh, x86 underscore x64.exe, and you run that installation, and then you pass a couple parameters, dash unattended mode, space, dash partner UID, and then you pass this same string after partner U customer or partner UID, then it will also install specifically to that customer. You can take the generic downloaded executable, rename it exactly like this, and it now installs into that container. Um, you can also pass proxies and um, uh, profile ID or profile name or product name parameters behind those uh, installers in order to change the default retention, set a default schedule, default selections, default uh, exclusions, um, uh, local speed vault paths, things of that nature. So there's lots of parameters you can pass in that initial deploy, but I didn't want people to have to decode all of the different command line stuff you can do to do an initial deploy and then come back up here and go, well, what if I need to reinstall? Oh, well, if you want to reinstall, it's these type of commands. The executable, 
dash silent dash user and then you pass a device name and a password and an encryption key that was previously used or a passphrase previously used to reinstall and reattach a device back to the original system um, so you know there's several different methods and ways of going about doing this there's the ability to install in read-only mode uh, there's the ability to install documents versus auto deploy a standalone server or workstation um, uh, and then of course all the different variables that you can apply to these pieces so uh, what I did to address that is I introduced um, uh, this PowerShell script here uh, version 21 right now so it's been around for a little while um, this guy is designed to uh, deploy differently based on the parameters you pass so you run the script dash documents and a customer UID and it deploys a workstation version with a very limited set of file selections based on extension types uh, 99 extension types I believe at last, at last count or auto deploy this could be a server or workstation for full protection of that machine and uh, you would pass the word auto deploy you pass a UID you could optionally pass things like set bandwidth or set archiving or uh, uh, you could pass a dash profile dash product uh, dash this dash that so several other parameters that are viable and work with uh, the auto deploy commands you could use it to upgrade just download and apply the new version of the software over top of the existing one to do a redeploy, uh, to do a reuse of existing stored credentials or to store credentials, copy credentials, uh, to have it restart the service after these commands are done, to force an overwrite. If it already found a backup manager, it will abort and say, oh, I can't install here. There's already one existing unless you pass the force command. Uh, remove command that's going to do an uninstall. Uh, test is going to do a connection test. Uh, help is going to go out and provides you the syntax for all of these different installation commands. They're all here in this one uh, fairly long script, uh, but you'll notice everything is broken up into, into functions. Uh, here's a function to start the backup service. Here's a function to stop the backup process. Uh, here's a function to set archiving, to set bandwidth. Uh, here's a function to copy the backup config or a, a function to uh, reuse the backup config, remove or uninstall the backup manager. Uh, here's a function, let's see, to redeploy. Um, so it goes through the various pieces, calls other functions if it needs them, nested functions, and so on. Um, this one command could be used to do just about everything in an install, uninstall, reinstall type of deploy. Uh, and since it is just a PowerShell wrapper around um, the command line, um, I'm going to use uh, my uh, Visual Studio code, and we're actually going to do a quick uh, deploy and redeploy, okay? So uh, here I've got my backup manager, uh, version 21 script. Um, and uh, you've got my documentation as to all the different commands and what they do. Um, the links to the documentation as well, the regular install, silent reinstallation. Um, here are the various parameters you can run. I'm gonna actually just uh, run this as an admin uh, here inside of uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, and I'll talk more about Visual Studio Code here in a minute while it's um, doing its thing so that we can talk about one of the other pieces that are here. Uh, but this opened up um, another PowerShell window. Uh, the script is running as administrator. Um, it's the back enable backup installer. You can use the dash help parameter with the script name uh, from a command line to get uh, this kind of help con uh, syntax. Uh, so we're in the help mode and the backup service is currently running. That means there's a backup manager installed on this machine. So I could run the command with dash help or dash UID documents or UID dash uh, profile name, product name, auto deploy or a takeover or a reuse or copy. Any of these are parameters or, that are valid uh, use cases. Um, so I've already got a backup manager on here. So I'm going to do um, uh, dot slash uh, deploy backup manager. But since there's already one here, I'm just going to do the test because uh, I want to see if this one's actually working and, fun and functioning properly. Uh, so we'll do the test. Uh, uh, response and see what's going on so uh, on this machine um, we're running this environment we ran it in uh, the test mode uh, it's checking the backup manager it's going through and getting some statistics and information let's see what it got it got the fact that the service is running it got the process is running so this is the process ID the CPU utilization the name of the process uh, the application status so it is a running application um, uh, it does a VSS check to see if VSS is healthy. C and E are the various volumes that are available for backup. It was able to check those and test a snapshot creation for both of them. Um, it came back down here now and pulled um, device statistics. What's the device name? Uh, this is the NetBIOS name uh, with a random five-digit underscore in the end from color deployment. 
Um, it's got remote connection capable. It's the English language. It's got a speed vault configured going to the uh, IV slash speed vault share, logged in as administrator. Uh, we don't show the passwords. Um, it's got email set up to run at a certain frequency, although there's no address set for it, and the password is hidden here, so we don't show us pa a password, as I said. Uh, current selections, we are including, the, we're back at the file system. The entire file system is included with normal priority with the exclusion or exception exclusions of CNTEL, CTEMP, E Offsite, Speed Vault, and E Seed. So we've got uh, all inclusions except for these exclusions. Uh, meaning any new volumes that were added or any new uh, directories that were added underneath C that weren't underneath Intel or TIMP would automatically be included. Uh, my active schedules are here, uh, active, uh, uh, no, active, no, active, yes, and this time and schedule. Uh, filters, these are exclusions, things that we're filtering out from the backup. So we never back up uh, D, E, or F. Uh, so it makes the selections here and it applies these filters at runtime. Uh, version info, we're running 21.7, the client tool, the current job status is idle, it's not running a job, and there's been no error uh, message from the cloud with last communication uh, cycle. So lots of good uh, monitoring notification things here. We could use this to populate a check to determine if it's overdue, over schedule, if we need to restart a service, if there's a, a if it's misconfigured, if a configuration change, we can monitor it and report on a, a change to the config uh, selections or the exclusions or the schedules or somebody turned off the schedule, whatever you choose there. But some really good command line information that we're pulling. I'll show you how to get that here uh, in just a little bit. Uh, but I wanted to show that to you before I did an uninstall. So we're going to uninstall this particular client and we're going to redeploy a brand new instance, okay? Uh, but let me show you what the client looks like, uh, just so you know. Uh, local host. <clears throat> so here's the backup client. Um, if I click on uh, the machine, here's the machine name, the version, the product, uh, the errors we had in the last backup session. Uh, let's see, we've got um, uh, the backup tab. Uh, over here, we can go and see what the selections are. So file and folder is everything minus these exclusions uh, from a deselected directory. If we go to preferences, we can see that the schedule, I have three schedules, only one is active. I've got um, uh, local speed vault configured. I've got archiving rules uh, turned on someplace here. There we go, archive rules, two of the three turned on. I've got backup filters for certain volumes. So all that information right there at my fingertips, but I didn't have to touch the UI to get it. Um, but we don't want to use this. We want to redeploy. We want to do documents deployment or just a, a brand new deployment, which is going to back up everything, not have those exclusions and not have any of the history tied to it. Uh, so to do that, uh, we're going to come into here and dash do a, a dash remove. Uh, Let me go through and uh, uninstall the backup client. Uh, why would you do this? Well, you might, uh, you know, like I said, need to redeploy because you backed up too much data, or it's got a, a you didn't do the speed vault setup when you did the initial run, or you didn't seed it properly, or you know, there's a dozen reasons why you might redeploy. Uh, you want to get rid of the full license and deploy documents uh, on the systems to just get that 99 file types I talked about. Um, so when the script ran, it knew that the service was running because it sees that and it's doing the uninstallation. Once it finishes, it'll report back if the service is uninstalled or no longer found or what have you so that you know the job is complete. Uh, this process could take about two minutes. Uh, I think it's my default timeout for an install and uninstall and upgrade, those kind of things. Uh, so we'll give it just a moment to do what it needs to do. Okay, um, so we can see that the uh, uninstall finished. Um, once it finished the uninstallation, it checked the service status. The service is no longer present. It's not that it's not running, it no longer exists. Um, so it did uninstall the service and the processes and so on. Um, so now I'm gonna run this again. Um, and um, instead of using the remove command, I'm gonna use the auto deploy command. Um, and if I specify auto deploy, and then I say I wanna use uh, uh, dash, uh, uh, product or profile name, I can specify those parameters, profile ID, uh, product name, so different parameters that can drop in. Um, I can also come in and specify the uh, UID right here as a string, although I'm not going to at the moment. Um, I could choose and say I want to do set uh, bandwidth, um, and, or I could do set uh, archive, and that'll turn on a default archive rule or a default bandwidth throttle. Um, and those are embedded uh, variables that are inside of the script right now, but they could be parameters where you say set archive and then you give it the parameters here in the script if you wanted to take it that far. 
Um, uh, what else could we do here? We could put it in read-only mode if we're going to be doing restores. Um, so lots of functionality here uh, from an auto-deploy perspective. Um, I'm going to do this auto-deploy set bandwidth and set archive, and I'll hit enter. Um, but I didn't specify a partner UID. It doesn't know where to install. It doesn't know what container this is going to go into. So it automatically says, oh, you missed this. This is a required component. What is the UID since I didn't specify it? Uh, we're going to go back to... Um, back to Postman, and we did an enumeration here for HEHCA. Um, it's down here. We're going to grab that partner UID because I'm going to deploy in the HEHCA uh, uh, Canadian region. So we'll grab that partner UID, take it out here to my script, and just paste it right in. Um, so what is it doing? Um, it's on a deploy. Um, we did not specify, the service is not running, it's not present. There's no profile product alias uh, defined. We didn't tell it to take over um, uh, encryption keys. We didn't tell it to force an install because there's nothing here to overwrite. Uh, we didn't tell it to store or copy an existing config file, but we did turn on the archiving and the bandwidth. So all of your parameters that you specified will show up as parameters um, uh, while you're running. If it found any conflict, it would error out and say, oh, we found a conflict. Do you want to force this? And it would specify what commands to force an override or force an install. Um, this installation, like I said, it could take up to two minutes for it to go through all the various pieces. Once it finishes, it'll check the service and the initialization commands to make sure that there's no communication errors or things like that before it um, uh, before it finishes. So um, if we've got anybody out there that's using a third party uh, RMM tool, um, you know, they're not utilizing um, uh, RMM or in central, uh, uh, subsets of this script or, or even the whole script could be very useful for you. Um, ideally though, you'll probably pick this apart and use just pieces of this to set up a deployment for auto deploy, a deployment for documents. And then maybe a separate script or variation that you can use for an upgrade or an uninstall or a redeploy. Um, much like I had those individual uh, dot, uh, .amp files for Automation Manager. Um, it gets a little overwhelming trying to put it all into one script and then know what additional parameters I have to pass when you're going through a third-party tool. Um, so I like having them as individual pieces there. But I keep this handy so that from any machine, um, oh, I need to uninstall, reinstall, I can, or store credentials. I don't have to think about it or go check my syntax. I just run it with the parameters that I know. Um, so uh, the uh, job completed, it's downloaded the backup manager, sorry, downloaded the backup manager, it auto-deployed, uh, the backup service is running, it's now setting the archive settings. So you can see here it used the default uh, environment to create a new archive rule that is active. Um, so once it finishes that, it will set the, the bandwidth throttle. So setting bandwidth throttle, there we go. So it set uh, limited band, limit your bandwidth from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. with 5 megabit upload, uh, unlimited or uh, negative one download. Uh, in kilobits per second um, with no limitations on Saturday or Sunday um, and then there's no uh, automatic cancel for it, certain plugins if they happen to be started during that uh, throttle window. It'll just cycle it down to five megabits. Um, any of these variables here or in the archive uh, could be changed inside the script as I said. Um, how would you use this? Uh, you could take this script, you could use it uh, on demand, you could set up with a rule or filter so that as new devices are added into a particular container or a partner, they automatically get the backup software. You ought to apply a profile and a product and all of those other settings so you don't it's kind of set it and forget it. You don't have to go back and touch it. Um, so in theory, you could deploy you know, 100 or 1,000 devices as quickly as you could deploy two devices because you don't have to go do a manual download or any other manual configuration for these machines. Get the system out there, get a base full backup of just the C volume or all volumes with common exclusions for temp directories or patch or update directories. Um, and, um, you know, come back and tweak it later to manage, you know, those, those uh, you know, one or two percent where you do to need to do something different. Um, or you set this up as part of a automated deployment process for cloning of laptops or new virtual machine deployments um, so that every new machine as it comes on board gets this new backup client tied to the NetBIOS name that's you know automatically embedded you know there's no uh, concern about server sprawl or or new machines um, being spun up that aren't getting protected um, so I've got an installation here uh, let's just prove what that installation is now since I uh, ran it. Um, so I'm going to come back into my backup client here. Then I go to my overview tab. You notice there's no history now. I go into the device. It's 21.7. It's an all-in. It's a 
device is Lenovo IdeaPad, so it's a different device name, even though the machine name is the same. Um, yeah, no history, uh, my backup selections, I don't have selections set yet because I didn't pass a profile, so I can set up my new selections, I go into preferences, go to schedule, I don't have a schedule yet, I need to add a schedule. So I chose a very basic, modest uh, deployment, um, but we're going to revert that now back to the uh, other environment. Um, so um, I stored my credentials uh, previously for this particular machine, so uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do just a reuse. So I'm gonna run this, I'm gonna do a um, reuse credentials, and I'm gonna do a restart command, so it'll restart the service, and I'll hit enter on that one, and it failed. Um, that's because um, it tried to grab those stored credentials from my previous installation and copy those back in over top of the current running uh, backup credentials. As soon as it saw there were existing credentials though, it aborted this process because it found the prior credentials. Um, if I run the same command again with dash force, um, then it's going to grab those stored credentials, apply them, restart the service, um, ignore the fact that there's already credentials there, and then I'll get myself back to the old uh, backup client. And because it's already using the existing downloaded installation, I don't have that two minute wait. Um, it's just basically wiping out one config and one set of credentials for another. Um, I've used this in lab environments to, uh, you know, have three different backup clients or backup managers running on the same machine to populate a lab or a dashboard or a UI. Um, but you can use this to prototype or test, you know, store the credential and then um, uh, since it's not running your backup right now, go and use it to evaluate or perform some other functions as long as you remember to send it back before, you know, uh, uh, the nightly backup schedule for the production machine. So um, service was running. Uh, service was stopped, service was stopped, service is now restarted and running. And if I come back to my backup client and refresh, um, service is being initialized, so it's waiting for that service to start. We'll let it get up and running, and then we'll be able to see it back in the old backup client. Okay, so we've got uh, most of the way there now. Um, so I've got my schedules back. I got my bandwidth throttle, and if they throttling turned on, I got my speed vault reconfigured. Um, yep, that's all through. I've got my backup filters. I've got the backup tab. I've got my uh, selections. If I go to my overview tab, I've got my history. So, yeah, right back where I was. Um, so, there were a couple of questions that came through. Um, Craig, I actually I liked yours. Um, let's actually see if I can talk about that a little bit more. Um, so, um, the backup client or the backup manager sees uh, fixed disks. Uh, like an external USB hard drive or an S, uh, or a uh, uh, NVMe drive in a chassis and things of that nature, uh, even though they're technically pluggable or removable, remove external, um, it still sees those as fixed disks instead of Windows. Uh, but things like a USB stick, um, a thumb drive, or an SD card, um, uh, we see those as removable media. They're reported by the OS as removable media. And removable media is purposely excluded from, from backup. It's not um, a volume or a disk that we can see as part of the file system uh, backup option. Um, and yeah, I don't have any way around that one. Um, uh, on the Mac and the Linux side, it's even uh, further compounded by the fact that an external USB hard drive shows up as removable media under Mac or Linux, uh, whereas it shows up as fixed disk under Windows. So um, uh, bigger constraints there, but uh, what you can do on your on your Windows systems, if you want to connect um, to that, um, you know, 256 gig uh, 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 thumb drive or SD card that you have, you could set up or connect to it via a, an admin share. Um, so um, what you'd want to do is make sure you have the network share data source turned on. Um, uh, so you'll see that show up uh, right here under network shares come in and add uh, a new share, but instead of going, you know, like hack, hack, uh, you know, back cave slash backup like I have here for uh, this particular NAS, you would add in an additional uh, system here and you go, um, you know, hack, hack, uh, local host um, uh, slash, uh, let's say Q uh, dollar sign, you can do the admin share, right? Um, and then save that connection. Uh, depending on whether it's uh, whether it's um, uh, on how your environment's set up, you may need to pass some credentials there, uh, so on and so forth. But as I expand this, um, I should be able to see that uh, path now and treat it like I'm backing up that environment and 
Um, maybe Q drive is not a volume that I have available right now. I may have to actually uh, specify some credentials here. We'll see. Um, so if you don't set it up as an admin share, you could set it up as a share with a name user um, and then specify those parameters as well. Okay, so there we go. So here, coming through the admin share for e-$sign, I can see the files on e-$sign, whether this is a physical disk now uh, or an iSCSI volume or, or you know, um, uh, uh, memory card or what have you, you'd be able to grab these. Uh, the only limitation you're going to run into is that if some of those files are open or in use, um, then um, I'm not going to be able to utilize VSS to grab an open file back above them. It's going to have to, you know, try its best to get a lock on the file and, and protect it that way. Um, so uh, just to finish reading your question here, yes, so you're saying it's a major issue um, uh, against the current version of backup. You know, high capacity SD cards is an extension of the internal disk, which contains important docs. No, that makes sense. Um, so um, yeah, utilizing this approach, um, you would be able to uh, to grab that. And yes, you could use the API to set those selections and configure those selections, um, uh, or um, you know enumerate uh, volumes, enumerate shares, things of that nature. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. If you need some more uh, work on that or some more help on how to figure out getting it set up and ensuring that it's being protected, um, just uh, schedule some time with me. Um, it's an interesting use case. I could uh, write a blog article about it. Um, I think I already tell people we don't protect it, but I haven't really told people you know, any real workarounds how they might be able to get access to it. Um, so uh, good query. I appreciate that. Okay, so that's uh, it for Q&A. Everything else I've got answered in line, I think. Uh, we've re-established or we've reset this client back up the way it was. Um, from a, a client perspective, it's out there, it's up and running, it's got everything that it needs. Um, how else would I do uh, configuration for this? Uh, well, you know, you can obviously come in through backup.management um, and and do certain levels of, of control and, and, and so on for it. Um, so yeah, hop into backup.management, I look at my variable, vari various lists of devices, I see my successes, I see my failures. Uh, you might have an error count over here, you have 365 errors, a job was aborted, here was an aborted, here was a failed, and you know, I can click on this and get you know, the, the two errors that uh, were here, and it'll give me the actual error message in addition to the count, VSS snapshot not found, service stopped, failed to send some files to storage. Well, if you see something like that, you don't really want to log a ticket. You just want to say, oh, um, automate restarting the VSS service that was stopped, uh, this this uh, task store here, and um, rerun the backup job. So you can make some self-healing if you know what these error messages are, right? Um, so getting the statistical information, grabbing it either at a client level or at a top level export level here um, can help you make the decisions. Sort all of your errors one way, um, look at timestamps when it was last successful, when it had a last login, when it last was synchronized off site, is the vault in the failure state, all kinds of different metrics we're gonna pull um, out of this interface. And then what do you do? Well, how do you take action? Well, you can pick a couple devices and you can issue a remote command uh, to start backup now. Um, this command is also just an API call, and I've got examples and samples in my GitHub that will allow you to uh, pass uh, these remote commands, or the majority of the remote commands, uh, uh, via this methodology, not just to um, 51 machines I can select here, but hundreds or thousands of machines if you've got that many under management, all in one fell swoop, so individually or in bulk. Um, other things you could do here, you could, um, obviously I set the GUI, uh, sorry, I set the, um, uh, throttle and the archive schedules when I deployed the device, but you could come back, back retroactively and set archiving and bandwidth right here. Exclusion filters, change scheduling, change selections, um, change the various settings, the logging level for debug logging and things like that. Issue an update for the backup, set a GUI password to lock the client. Um, you could come in and select multiple devices here and assign a profile or a recovery testing plan. Everything that you see me doing here in the UI, I can do via the API, and I can do it quicker in bulk for um, uh, you know resolving issues uh, or um, addressing configurations or you know getting proactive versus reactive uh, when things fail. Next structure here: uh, backup monitoring and health. Um, 
So that was a little bit of what uh, I was just showing you there inside of the UI. Um, but I want to do a little bit of it from the client side. Um, I'm going to show you a set of uh, PowerShell commands uh, that I'm utilizing inside of uh, 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 Rack inside of Visual Studio. Um, they're command line components uh, using uh, the client tool, command line utility, wrapped in PowerShell, um, and then I'm running them from VS Code. And I'm going to do this in a looped scenario so that we can cause failures and see what the results are. Um, I wouldn't expect you to run this script as something as a whole in your organization, but I would expect you to take pieces of this and introduce it into checks or monitors and then take action upon some of those failures potentially. Um, if you want to work with me on some of those to determine what a failure is and what a root cause or condition is, um, I can help you identify what the checks are. Um, and then you can decide what you want to do from an action perspective. Do you log a ticket? Do you report the data to the ticket? Uh, do you just fail the job? What do you, what do, you do? Okay. Um, whoops. Um, so um, the command line guide here for the client tool is uh, linked right here. It's also in the handout document. Uh, please download that before the session is over if you haven't done that already. Um, and we're going to get into uh, the command line here. That's not the command line. Where is the command line? I need it right there. There's the command line. So I am in the C program files backup manager directory. Uh, there's a command here called client tool. Um, and if I do client tool uh, by itself, I'll get some syntax. So client tool, global argument, command arguments, or client tool help to get the, uh, the syntax for it. Um, if I use the documentation, um, it's going to give me uh, examples and samples of all of these different commands as well. Uh, but you can also uh, pull it in here by saying client tool uh, help uh, dash command. Uh, and we'll do control dot uh, status dot get. And you get the syntax for this. So control dot status dot get prints the current program status. Um, optional output a path and it'll drop the uh, results to um, uh, I'm sorry, a dash path, and you can specify the uh, path to the config.ini file. Um, you can say machine readable or non-interactive or version. It'll print different output levels, or it'll include headers or non-include headers, or comma delimited or comma separated or different delimiters. So you can get the output quite a few different ways. Um, we're going to do it without the help and without the command function here. And I'm going to look at control.status.get, and my current backup job is idle. Okay, control dot uh, backup dot start. This is a great uh, command line com uh, command to use with a desktop shortcut for workstation users that are not always on good bandwidth. So instead of having schedules because they're on metered connections or cell connections, you might just have an icon on the desktop that they click uh, when they want to run or do a Delta backup. So client tool control dot backup dot start is now going to start the backup for these two data sources. Um, if I go back up to the previous command, control.status.get, I am now scanning instead of in idle state. Um, so you can see what's going on with your client. You can build your selections, uh, change selections, adjust and modify schedules, uh, set or exclude filters, turn on or remove archiving, uh, trigger or restore operation, uh, lots of stuff that you can do here, okay? Um, but since I've got wrappers, we want to use this to look at the kind of the read-only components of where you might have problems. Um, so we're going to go to, um, I believe, here. Um, and I've got a script here called get client errors. This is just version two of the script. Um, and this script is a little bit different. Like I said, it's not designed to be run as a whole, um, with the exception of when I'm running it now. This is going to um, set a counter of zero and run this script repeatedly uh, with a few seconds between each task uh, until it gets to 500 runs of all of these individual components. And the reason it does that is so that I can go break the backup manager and unplug network cards and cause things to fail to see if the errors are resulting the way I want and if it's giving me proper, uh, proper checks. Uh, so we're going to run this uh, as an administrator and um, I will accept the UAC. So what is this doing? Um, it checks the uh, product to see is it initialized, can it talk to the cloud? It checks the application status, the process, the process is running. It checks the job status. The job is actually scanning for a backup right now. 
it triggers a VSS snapshot. So it sees C and E volumes, and it was able to successfully snapshot those uh, with VSS to be able to do or, or start a sample backup. Um, it looks at the home node and the cloud storage node. This is the cloud targets where it's writing data or communicating. It does a um, uh, upload and download communication to those environments, uh, moves some items around to, to check bandwidth and uh, ability to resolve the cloud. It then gives me uh, session information, configuration information on this particular client, so I can see what's going on there. Um, and it is probably doing something else. We'll give it a moment. Um, um, so it grabbed uh, selections, current data sources, what's included for selections, what's excluded. So I've included my entire file system with normal priority, and then I've set exclusions specifically for C Intel, C Temp, E Offsite, and E Seed. Uh, system state inclusive, all of it. Current volume filters, including F, D, and E. So those filters come in uh, on demand after my selections. Um, current schedules, current archive schedules, file system, there's no error in the most recent file system backup, system state, the last system state backup had a couple errors. So you can see here, it couldn't find the snapshot and the service was not running and it failed to send some data to the cloud. Um, so um, lots of different things going on here, a lot of status checks, I'm trying to run through them in a certain sense of order, um, but they're just going to run one after the other, one after the other as I break or start or stop, close services, abort a job, may change selections, whatever it may be. What you've got here, though, is a list of commands you can use in, for, for other purposes. Um, and they're very basic commands. It's um, uh, uh, client tool, uh, control.initialization-error get, control.application status get, control.status get, VSS check, storage check, control settings.list. Setting .list. Um, so those are the commands that are being ran here. Um, I'm doing a little additional error checking here. I said, well, if the service isn't running, well, then don't try to run the command because it's going to fail. So I check first to see if the service is running, I check to see if the process is running. And if those items are not running, then I just skip the check and keep moving on. And I try some things additionally at the end. Um, as I get closer down here, though, I'm going to go through and look at my list of selections and my list of filters and schedules and say, of my list of data sources that are in my selection list, give me the errors for each of those individual data sources. So um, all of these, uh, and they're prefaced with a little pound sign here and, and some, some help text. Um, each of these are standalone uh, client tool commands wrapped in PowerShell to give you that particular output. Um, and you can take that and uh, capture the error code and act upon that error code if you like to then cause another function, like let's restart a service, uh, let's uh, trigger a backup job, let's uh, um, you know, uh, log an error um, to check the firewall or whatever that may be. Um, kind of a um, uh, starting point for some of you guys from a monitoring and, and a diagnostics perspective. Um, I'd like to take it a little bit further, but the, the real question here is what action do you take when you see some of these things? You know, what would you do? Would you try to self-heal it? Would you just want to report or alert on it? That's what I want to do is I want to work with some partners on a few of these to kind of build out some best practices. Um, and I need real world and cases and environments, not just me breaking the backup manager. I want to be able to pump this into an environment where you've got actual failures and alerts, and then let's diagnose troubleshooting. What are we going to do next? Can we action it, or do we need to just inf provide information and alert on it? Okay, um, so if any of this sounds interesting to you guys uh, and you want to have a follow-up call with me, by all means, hop on my calendar, use that Calendly link, um, and we can go through and try to set up some alerts and some checks, and um, I can help uh, expand upon these if there's other items we want to look at. Uh, for instance, there might be prior session history information we want to gather, or what was, how big was the last backup, how big was the last archive, you know, um, how long has it been since the last archive, it's been longer than X, um, check the schedule, turn one on, force one for tonight, you know, whatever that may be. Um, looking at different timestamps for servers versus workstations. Obviously, servers should be online, so if they haven't had successes within the last 24 hours, that's a red flag. Do something, not just trick an error, but kick off an on-demand backup. Uh, restart the services if it can't uh, phone home. Um, maybe restart VSS if it finds a VSS-specific error that we know we can address by restarting a service, or schedule a reboot, you know, trigger a reboot through RMM or through Incentral that's gonna happen you know, after a certain hours. Um, so there's lots of possibilities here. Um, Alan, appreciate that. Um, I know you, that uh, you've given me some good ideas and some other items. So yeah, we'd love to work with you on that one. Um, 
Okay, um, so this guy, I'm going to stop my script because the last time I did this, I let it run behind the scenes and it was slowing me down. Uh, so I'm going to cancel out of this one. Um, this is um, not currently uh, posted onto my GitHub page. I think I've got a variation of it up here, uh, but I'm only in version number two of this one. Um, I will add it in here um, uh, probably later this evening or, or first thing in the morning. Um, I want to go through and, and uh, maybe just do a little bit more documentation up here as to the various behaviors and so on. Um, but you know, you guys are kind of getting the first look at this. Um, I did post it on one of our um, uh, internal Slack channels for some of our elite partners to get their feedback on a few of these items as well, but um, not really uh, generally available just yet. So you guys are in that early adopter phase of some of this. My next component is um, File Explorer. Um, so not only can I uh, parse the output of that client tool command, I can also parse the output of a couple of different uh, status files or status documents that exist um, on the various machines. So um, if I come into a system and go to um, uh, C program data, and you're going to have a folder labeled MXB. Inside of there, there's a backup manager directory. Um, and there, uh, inside of that, you're going to see session uh, report.xml. Uh, open with, open with, open, open with. I used to open this up with Internet Explorer, but I don't have IE on this machine now. So uh, let's so go to Notepad++ and see if that helps. Uh, let's see, view, uh, word wrap. Still not super helpful. Okay, so this is an XML document. Um, and let's see here. Uh, the way it's listed, session statistics, uh, account. Uh, uh, here's the entry, starting entry for account and the, the closing entry for account. So um, the device name or the account name is laptop uh, dash 53H so and so. Um, session ID. Um, so the most recent backup session ID is right here. Uh, the plugin, file system plugin, uh, was that last session. What time did it start? What time did it end? What was the selected size in bytes? Um, the process size in bytes. Uh, the changed size count, uh, changed errors, um, how much uh, data was processed, um, the count for files that were processed. So there's lots of good statistic information in here for each of your individual data sources um, that can be parsed out. Um, remove file counts from previous sessions. So you can see um, all of those different uh, session times for each of your individual data sources all the way back, I believe, to the beginning of time. Um, so let's go and see um, what my oldest session is. Uh, my oldest session is going to be um, uh, 8-8-2017. So that was my, that was my oldest backup session in here that I can look at, and I can see all of that statistical information here and determine did I get a big spike or a big change or um, was there a large delta that sent more data to the cloud this time than before? We can use this uh, and parse it to give you those uh, change control or configuration control. Um, I saw a spike, I saw a drop, um, and then that might be worth throwing a ticket or throwing an error, okay? Uh, the other component in there is around the status. So that was sessions. Now we're going to look at status. Um, and let's do this with... Um, so I don't want to do Notepad if I can help it. What else can I open this with? Open with uh, WordPad, uh, Office XML Handler. I don't know if Office XML Handler is going to do anything for me here. Let me see what I get out of that. Ooh, no, I guess Office XML Handler doesn't want to work. Maybe Firefox will give me something vis uh, visual, visually pleasing. We'll see. Oh, yeah, that's where, that works. That's acceptable. Um, so it didn't necessarily find a style guide for this, but at least this is a bit more a bit more usable and readable. So here you can see statistics for this device, uh, count ID, name, alias, uh, the hashed version of the password for the uh, device account, part of the story credentials in that config file. Um, so uh, see creation, uh, creation date, expiration date, timestamp, not every field or variable here gets populated. So uh, timestamp, last time it checked in, in Unix time, current code, current status, what it's doing right now, it's scanning for the job, it's part of the backup nerd lab partner, 
um, current use storage in bytes, the OS version, client machine name. Um, so you can parse uh, uh, these keys here and get quite a bit of information um, for uh, the device based on configuration. Um, I use this for local speed vault checks. I've already got uh, uh, monitors written for that for both in Central and RMM. And I'll come down here and see, is the speed vault enabled? Yes or no? Is it synchronized? Yes or no? If it isn't synchronized, what's the percentages, both on the vault and in the cloud? Um, how much data is archived, uh, the retention periods, things of that nature. And then you can get down here and there's sections on each and every data source to see what the last session um, and the pre-recent session count information is. So we can see here for a given device what uh, the current and last were if you don't want to monitor all sessions. Um, so we'll get down here through all of the various plugins. Not all plugins are active on this machine, uh, but we can see for system state here is the system state data. Here's my color bar. This is the color bar for the last 28 days, uh, each number corresponding to a success, a failure, a ran, didn't run, what have you. Um, I'll show you how we can convert that over to graphical information here uh, in a little bit. Um, all the various data sources for plugins. Uh, there should be data sources down here for restore sessions as well. Uh, if we've done any restores on a given machine. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, bare metal recovery, restore information if there was any. Um, so lots of good information that could be parsed and worked with. So um, uh, the goal would be for you guys, if you want to work with me on this one, uh, what are the checks and the balances and the uh, actionable items you're looking to um, work against? And then um, I can help you identify how to grab that information. Um, and then we'll figure out what are the actions that we want to take. Um, and some of that may be on you uh, based on scripting inside of RMM or uh, a particular function or control you want to take. We may want to involve one of our other um, uh, head nerds from an automation uh, perspective, or um, I may need you to get involved with um, you know, your RMM manufacturer and some of the scripting and their actionable items. Let's say you're using a ConnectWise or an Automate or something like that, um, you know, that you um, you know, may need to get them to help out with what's the actionable item if we find a failed result. Okay, so we're going to do some generating and exporting of reports. Uh, why are you going to do these? Well, you want to pull data out of the console. You want to reconcile your invoice or your bill against actual usage, those kind of, of structures. Um, um, obviously, you can come into uh, the backup dot management console at any point and grab some of this data, but uh, even that could be problematic because you have to log in to get it, right? Um, so I'm in here in MHH computing, I set filters, I, may, I, I grab and drag and move columns around and put them where I want them. I come up here and hit the export button and I can get a aggregate device uh, statistic report for a given end of month or today or a maximum value report to get usage for a given month is a single file or multiple files and how do I want my human readable formats and things like that. And it's gonna give me the columns I have selected here currently and I can turn on more columns. Remember these short codes uh, that I showed you at the very beginning that correspond to the different uh, 500 plus different types of columns we have. I can get the data out, but let's say I wanted to automate that. So it was always the same data and always the same structure, always at the same time, always saved in the, saved in the same directory. Uh, well, to do that, um, I could um, uh, do a postman call like get statistics uh, right here. And uh, this get statistics is gonna go through and enumerate account statistics for a given partner ID. If I don't know the partner ID, I can look it up based on name like I did here at the previous call. Um, I can have a filter to say only show me timestamps within a certain number of days ago, or only show me OSs where the OS name has, you know, star Windows star in it. So I'm only getting Windows servers or Windows workstations, or I can say, only servers or only workstations by using the uh, OT equals one or OT equals two uh, variables here. All these filter filters and uh, advanced syntaxes are uh, documented in our, our, our uh, 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 support site, or I've got blog articles that talk through some of the advanced filters and so on. Uh, these are the columns I'm going to export. So I'm going to pull out AN, AU, AP, TJ, TO, AR, MN, and so on. Uh, including some recovery credentials. Um, I'm going to start at record number zero and I'm going to pull five devices. Um, and it's all I'm going to pull, but I'm also going to subtotal the count of devices, the sum of selected size and used storage down here. So we'll get some total numbers as well. Um, and the results I get from that are going to be uh, this. So I'm going to get um, uh, result.result, .result, account ID, that's my device ID, an auto-deployed auto device, 
uh, under uh, this partner with these settings. So account name is this, um, uh, active data sources or file system. It's under the uh, Backup Nerd Lab um, uh, partner. Um, the AU, uh, the, which is the uh, device ID. Um, uh, let's see, FJ was the most recent file and folder backup status. Uh, here's a size count for file and folder selected side. Here's the machine name, the NetBIOS name. Um, what else? We've got um, the uh, uh, partner reference. In this case, it was just 500 tied to a fair use capacity or whatever freeform text you really want to enter there. Um, uh, disaster recovery uh, 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 status of the last recovery session. Here are the links to the actual screenshots. Um, let me see if I can click that screenshot and actually get that to come up. Follow the link, control click. Um, I have to check my date on that one, I guess. That may be a, an old or an invalid, invalidated screenshot. We'll, uh, we'll check on that here in a minute. Um, there should be a date tied to it. Um, uh, RVO, uh, yeah, so this would be the timestamp of that actual environment. Um, this would probably be the completion time or the restore total restore time. Um, here are my uh, color bars over time. So I've got successes except for the current running status. Um, uh, YV, this is synchronization uh, information for the local speed vault, so 100% synchronized. Um, so all of those columns are interesting, but if you don't know the column names, you got to go cross-reference and look them up or look at those documentation articles that I showed you a little earlier. I can make this a lot easier for you, and I've already built those wrappers inside of PowerShell. Um, so we're going to move back over into this environment, and we're going to grab the uh, Get Device Statistics report or script, um, and we're going to look at some of the things that we've done so far today. Um, so we're going to start at the very, very beginning of the script. Um, I've got my about in here. What does the script do? What's it named? How do you contact me to get more information? Um, the legalese, uh, obviously keep the lawyers happy. Uh, compatibility. So this is a script for standalone backup. Um, it is going to, uh, it may contain some non-public API calls, and some of those are subject to change without uh, notification. Um, so if you ever have a problem with one of these and it's not running as you expect, um, drop me a quick email, drop me a quick note, hit me on social. Uh, I may need to check it really quickly to see if, if maybe there was an update that was applied to something that was not uh, publicly documented. Uh, but for the most part, I try to stay with as much documented as possible. Um, what do I do here? I get, check, store with using a secured credential. Uh, I authenticate to backup.management. You've already seen me do that, but I do this in a way that's secured and not passing free text or uh, clear text passwords. Um, I check the partner level, enumerate or list the partner, uh, enumerate a list of partners underneath me, present it to you in a graphical way versus a uh, uh, JSON list so that you can pick them from a, uh, a selection list. I then enumerate all the devices under that selected or selected partners um, and let you GUI select those. And then I present to you a graphical view of all of the dashboard, or I let you export out to Excel or CSV, um, choose your delimiters, and so on and so forth. So all of those are parameter functions that can be ran with against this script. Uh, so we're going to run this guy really quick. Uh, so here it is. Um, we're going to pass some additional parameters because I've got default set that don't export and don't launch. Um, so I'm going to break the script and we'll do dot slash. Um, get device statistics version 7 and I'm going to do dash export dash launch as my only two uh, additional parameters um, and we'll run this now you can see how it's changed that export and launch uh, flag up here it wants to know the name of the partner that I want to run this against remember I did a partner lookup uh, a script a little earlier based on partner name so I'm going to run this against my SE demo environment um, and I'll type that partner name in here. It is exact case sensitive, just like the uh, prior query. Uh, you'll notice I didn't enter a, a credential to log in. It read my credential file that it found, um, saw my partner name, my user uh, ID, and it knows my password is there. It's reading the encrypted format and uh, pulling it out and decrypting it uh, based on the fact that I'm my current logged in user and my user profile on this machine. Um, this script would not work on any other machine, even if I move those credentials over um, and the script over, I would have to recreate the new credential file by re-entering uh, all of my uh, user login information. If it can't find it, it will prompt me for it. 
so now I'm going to go with uh, SE demo. That's my sample uh, environment um, from a lab perspective. So I'll run that one. Um, it queried SE demo. It found the partner ID. It found the GUID for that partner, so I could actually do auto deployment to that container. Um, it presented it to me in a graphical view. This is outgrid view. It's a component of PowerShell. Um, it allows me to build menus or selection lists or give me a bit of a formatted output that I can work with versus having to deal with everything in text or dump it to Excel. Um, I can sort and filter on this one with various criteria, or I can just search and say, show me uh, the, the, the uh, Latin America uh, container or partner, or show me one that's uh, the Asia Pacific or uh, that are uh, in production. Uh, and so on and so forth. So I've picked this. I'm going to pick the top level. That's going to give me the parent, not the end customer's creation time converted from Unix timestamp into human readable UTC. Um, here's my partner UID for those auto deployment strings like we did when we were deployed a client a little earlier. The trial uh, was never created for these. They went straight into production at the beginning, so they didn't have a trial expiration or a trial um, start time. Um, so that information is visible here as well. And we're going to hit OK. It's now enumerating those devices. What are the devices under those containers that we can work with? Well, here they are. Um, so we can see I've got uh, partner ID, partner name, reference, account ID, device name, computer name, creation, timestamp, last success, color bar converted to ASCII characters, successes, didn't run, currently in progress, alerts, failures, um, uh, product IDs, product names, profile IDs, profile names, data sources that are configured for selection, any column in the console can be made visible in here. I'm just picking out, you know, 20 or so that I can utilize here. Is it a physical machine or a virtual machine? What's the OS type, server or workstation, or undefined or um, not deployed possibly? So I can pick a couple of these uh, or all of these or filter and sort with my various criteria up here. Contains, includes, doesn't include. Hit OK. And now I get my output to my console, into my AMP, into my script, into my wherever I want to go. Uh, also behind the scenes, it's generating CSV and Excel. Um, I can generate pivot tables automatically and change focus and highlight and configure. Um, here's my launched Excel with all of that same information, with all the same formatting um, that could automatically save with a unique time date stamp tied to the statistic for the partner name and the partner ID as an Excel or a CSV. They're both in that container. So lots of things you could do here. Um, I have subscripts that can use this and send out as an email. Um, so it shows up in your inbox, just dropping in your SMTP configuration information for your Gmail account. Or if you allow it, you could send mail from your Microsoft 365 domain. You obviously, you have to enable that type of functionality, but um, you could automate sending this kind of stuff out um, wherever you need it to go with whatever kind of automation you want. Or just because you can pull it this way and work with it inside of the API, we could drop it to the console, drop it into a log, and use the checks and balances in your RMM tool to push this into um, um, uh, an error, an error uh, or a ticket or a log or some other um, format or location, okay? I know that was a lot of leading up to this particular point, but it kind of ties um, a lot of those things together. Um, if we go back into my script here, um, I said I'd do a lot of these things for you a little earlier. So I've got my functions in here, uh, and these functions are for all the various things. Here's a function to set API credentials. Um, so this creates and stores those uh, encryption, uh, th those login credentials um, as uh, encrypted values in a, uh, a key file or a text file. Um, if it can't find it, it'll create a new one. Um, here is the get API credentials. This reads those credentials. If it can't find them, it'll ask you to recreate them. Um, and then finally, um, this uh, get API credential, I'm sorry, not get, send API credentials actually logs into the cloud with the credentials that it either, were, either were just set or just received. And if it finds an error or a failure, it will recycle for this and say, hey, invalid login, invalid problem, please re-enter your credentials, try again. If you do it too many times, it's going to lock you out of the console for a while. Um, conversion from Unix time to time date, uh, to date time, sorry. So here we're taking the seconds from uh, January the 1st, 1970, and converting those seconds into um, uh, UTC time. That single function works really great. Here's my save as CSV as an Excel file, does the conversion. Um, here's a PowerShell wrapper to get partner info. Um, so it takes get partner info, passing just the partner name, 
we did the script in Postman a little earlier, um, all wrapped in a nice uh, function in PowerShell, uh, convert to JSON, uh, generate an output. If there's an error, uh, then do this. Don't allow users or partners that are of a certain level type. So it restricts those. It makes me enter a new partner name so I can work at an MSP or reseller level. If it errors out, print the error or force it to uh, re-enter again. Um, so some nice logic in here to go through that full process. Uh, enumerate partners. This lists all those partners. So fetch all the partners under this partner ID, fetch recursively, give me all of the statistics from zero to 22, um, the various um, uh, partner statistics, and then present that in a list um, using that out grid view that I can graphically select the partner from. Uh, get devices. This gets my device list with all of the various columns. This was the last call we looked at in Postman. Um, so uh, pass a partner ID, pass a filter, pass a list of query columns to query sorted by creation date in descending order with this subtotal for up to how many devices. Uh, I think 5,000 is my default in the script, but it could be less, it could be more. Um, convert it to JSON, upload it. And once we get the results, I don't know what AR means or what AU means. Well, so I, down here, create mapping, create a new array based on the fields I want and the right mapping that I want. I lost my mouse here, bear with me a second, I gotta find it. There we go. Um, so down here, I take uh, device result dot partner ID and make that a column called partner ID. Setting dot AN is the device name. MN, computer name or machine name. AL is device alias. Down here, I take creation, timestamp, and last success and the results are in Unix time, but I convert the Unix time as I'm as I'm cycling through and enumerating these. Here I take the last 28 days and uh, various uh, color bars and convert those and replace the number eight with a particular ASCII character, uh, the number one with a particular ASCII character. So you get that graphical view. Here I take uh, bytes and convert or divide by one gigabyte to get all of my units in gigabytes. Um, so a lot of that work has been done for you all you really need to do is come in here and take this and say, I need uh, four more specific columns, drop them into the query here, come down here, name those, um, and adjust the output so that the output is in the format you want, um, and you've got new columns showing up in your in your rows. Um, uh, the rest of this here, uh, pretty much determining, determining outputs, does it generate a CSV, it looks at the various structures, and then runs this or runs that. If you said to launch it, it looks to see if you have Excel installed. If so, it will launch Excel. Otherwise, it will launch uh, the CSV. Um, so, you know, 572 lines to get a statistic, but there's lots of reusable components inside of here that you would use or I reuse across all of my scripts. This is just one of the uh, more advanced. Um, I've got another one here that's uh, going to be outside of the scope for today, uh, but it'll go through and enumerate your usage. Uh, break it up by servers, workstations, documents, Office 365, look at it billing over a given month, and then it will create a pivot table for you and uh, summarize so that way you've got you know a nice reconciliation that you can go against your, your invoice or your bill um, or turn around and use to, to generate your invoices for your customers. Okay. Uh, Craig had asked, uh, asked here quickly, could he please see the command prompt screen again uh, showing the uh, client tool commands. Uh, absolutely. Let me bring that back up for you uh, now that we're concluded. Uh, here's the list of client tool commands that are available. So you just uh, do um, uh, client tool space help. Um, and then, of course, the other syntax for that or the other use for, uh, or the other capability there is to use the link in my um, uh, handout document to uh, open up the uh, documentation page for that. And once you get into there, here's the command line interface. It tells you where it is in Windows, Linux, and Mac. It exists in all three. Um, uh, the way the syntax works for the commands. Here's a summary of the different types of commands. So like archiving, control archiving add, control archiving list, control uh, optional commands, uh, syntax to um, uh, do the various pieces. And then you can actually, you know, grab an example here that you might actually, you know, build and play with. So uh, lots of structure there. Um, and if you need something above and beyond what you see here, or you've got a question on how you might use something, don't hesitate to, to reach out, okay? Um, at the bottom of the screen, um, oh, at the bottom of the screen, uh, the commands that you've already ran, sure, I can show you that. 
Uh, let's see. Uh, so we're here. Um, so what did I do? I did uh, client tool control status get, and I have the idle control backup start, um, which gave me the file system and the system state that was what was configured. Um, and then control status get, which is going to be the scanning. Uh, if I do that now, I'm in idle state again. Okay, hopefully it helps you out, Craig. Um, and then there was uh, that um, PowerShell script, which has a lot of those commands uh, dropped into it as well. Um, that one I will be posting up to my GitHub. Um, so feel free to uh, clone that repository uh, or download or pull those down um, uh, here shortly or, or check back on that one to uh, see the new items.